Good afternoon. Uh, before we begin proceedings, can I deal with an issue from earlier today? The presiding officer undertook to reflect on a point of order which was raised during First Minister's questions by Stuart Maxwell as convener of the Education and Culture Committee on comments made by Ruth Davison. Mr Maxwell's concerns related to Ruth Davison's assertion that the Education and Culture Committee had published a report on attainment. The presiding officers have now had a chance to examine the official report of First Minister's questions. Ruth Davidson was reflecting on a letter from the committee to the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning, seeking her views on written evidence received during its inquiry on attainment. In doing so, Ruth Davidson described this as reporting back. She subsequently referred to the letter from the committee, and the contents of that letter are not something for the presiding officers to rule on. We consider that the point has now been clarified and therefore we consider the matter to now be closed. And I now turn to this afternoon's business. And the first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 13134 in the name of Richard Lockhead on the circular economy waste management. Could I invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Richard Lockhead to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, a generous 14 minutes. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to be able to open today's debate, our first ever debate on the opportunities of a more circular economy for Scotland. Uh, this is the first time we're debating this important subject, and I'm certain, however, it won't be the last. In the traditional economy in which we live, or have lived in the past, we take, we make, and we dispose. We take resources from the ground, air or water, we make products, and then we dispose of them. A circular economy is about retaining the value of our primary resources, designing, reusing, repairing and remanufacturing, and exploring new business models that support a more circular approach. We are getting better at disposing of goods in a way that lessens the impact on the environment. We are landfilling less, we are recovering energy, particularly from food waste, and we are recycling what we can. But I think we all accept that business as usual is not an option. We need to act now to put the value of our resources at the heart of Scotland's economy. Creating a circular economy in Scotland is an economic, environmental and moral necessity. It will create jobs in our communities, improve our quality of life and, of course, it's just good sense. Major new economic powers are emerging in Brazil, India, Indonesia and Korea and elsewhere. The climate is changing and the world's population is changing. Therefore, our demands for the world's resources are also changing. Globally, by 2030, we may need around 40% more water, 80% more steel, and 33% more energy, just to give examples, some examples of increasing demand. Commodity prices are more volatile these days and have increased, as we all know, sharply since 2000. And the Ellen MacArthur Foundation identified a saving of £1.3 trillion globally if we move to a more circular economy. We are all politicians and we're politicians with the means to design and influence action in Scotland, as well as the rest of the UK and throughout Europe. Therefore, it's a responsibility to show as much leadership as we can in this important area. Last October, the Guardian newspaper identified five countries moving ahead of the pack on action when it comes to the circular economy. I'm pleased to say Scotland stands alongside Denmark, the Netherlands, Sweden and Japan in leading that pack. The Green Alliance, the UK environmental think tank, has also said that Scotland is a long way ahead of other parts of the UK in its policy support for resource productivity. We are all too familiar with products that seem to be designed to be discarded after relatively short use. That could be our mobile phones with its, their sealed casings or a washing machine sentenced to a very short life because the part you need isn't available anymore. Therefore, design for a circular economy is the first step. When a product has fulfilled its first life, reuse is almost always the preferred option. Reusing a product retains the embedded value of materials, the labour and the energy involved in making it in the first place and avoids the demand for new resources to create another new product. Repair is by no means a new concept. We wouldn't dream of scrapping a car just because the alternator goes, but how often have we replaced a TV, a vacuum cleaner, or a coat or any other part of clothing because it's too difficult to get it repaired or fixed. Remanufacture us when we take apart a product and rebuild it to the same or better standard as the original. 
In that context, new resources are avoided and remanufacturing can be much less energy intensive than manufacturing a new product. And in our traditional or linear economy, there is little incentive to make products reliable or easily repaired or design them so that valuable parts can be salvaged when they can't be repaired. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, the concept of a circular economy can be daunting, but it starts to make sense once you unpack it into visible, practical things we can do. In January this year, the Green Alliance I referred to in the Scottish Council for Development Industry published a report identifying key opportunities for Scotland in particular sectors. Those include a potential £140 million opportunity, for instance, from simply converting whisky byproducts into feed for the fish farming industry, or reusing steel from decommissioned oil and gas rigs instead of melting them down for recycling, and that could cut associated carbon emissions by over 80%. And in March, I published a report setting out the potential value of remanufacturing to Scotland. Remanufacturing is already worth £1.1 billion in the Scottish economy, supporting around 17,000 jobs, with potential, however, to grow by £620 million by 2020 and create another 5,700 jobs. And I was also privileged to recently open the fantastic new Scottish Institute for Remanufacture in Glasgow earlier this year, established with £1.3 million of support from Zero Waste Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council. And that innovative centre will focus on uh, innovation generally within remanufacturing, collaborative projects and establishing a remanufacturing community in Scotland. It's worth noting it's only one of four such centres in the world, Singapore, New York and Beijing, and they are the others, and this is therefore the first in Europe. Scotland's reuse sector is also developing. The Revolve brand sets out standards and quality for reused goods in Scotland and is operated by Zero Waste Scotland with partners such as Community Recycling Network Scotland. So reuse is growing. And many of us, of course, will have bought used goods from eBay or Gumtree or elsewhere, so we're familiar with that. My officials do indeed tell me that there's a burgeoning industry in pre-loved luxury goods such as designer fashion and handbags. I take their word for it, it's not something I've got personal experience of, but it's another example of what's happening out there. And with our rich heritage and textiles, Scotland is in a fantastic position to support the reuse sector. Only a few weeks ago, my colleague, the Minister for the Environment, Ailey McLeod, attended an exhibition in her constituency where small companies, including Hamish Mash Eco Fashion, were displaying some very smart clothes. So whether it be the gearboxes that are manufactured by companies such as Mackey's, a family business in the east end of Glasgow, or computer hardware refurbished for re reuse by Retech and Bride, or, or textiles upcycled into desirable clothing in Dalbiti, these are credible, sustainable businesses putting quality everyday products onto the market. And of course, they're doing so in a way that keeps materials circulating in their economy, reducing our reliance on new materials and new resources. This all complements the work already underway by Resource Efficient Scotland, bringing together support on energy, water and materials in a unique approach to help businesses in the public sector in Scotland. This represents substantial progress, which I intend to build upon by publishing a circular economy roadmap, bringing all these issues together in the next few months for consultation. That strategy will set out the opportunities that suit the characteristics of Scotland as a nation, upon which we will focus our efforts. The circular economy is about much more than recycling, but we are all familiar with recycling systems. Scotland, as again we all know, has some of the most ambitious recycling targets, not just in the UK but elsewhere, and we're aiming to recycle 70% of our waste by 2025, 10 years' time. But recycling quality is as important as quantity, and low-quality, contaminated recyclate is sold off cheaply and often abroad, and we have to address that. It becomes low-value commodities, and there is little motivation for householders to recognise the value in the products they put in their recycling bins. So we need high-value, clean recyclate that can be kept in much higher value use. One example of what's happening is Dryden Aqua, a small business in Midlothian that makes high-tech water filters from waste glass. I had the pleasure of visiting them, I think it was about 18 months ago. And Dry Aqua are an amazing, innovative Scottish company that have an international reputation, but they face a challenge in getting consistent, reliable sources of glass from our local authorities in sufficient quantities. Simultaneously, they're highlighting the opportunities of a more circular economy, however, and some of the challenges, of course, in making that transition. 
So that is one reason why I established recently the Scottish Materials Brokerage Service. Despite the name, it's quite an exciting idea and will bring stability for Scottish organisations to what can be a volatile market. It's all about bringing together materials and the quantities required to attract reprocessing infrastructure to Scotland. So if all of our local authorities and everyone else that's collecting those materials go through the brokerage service, then the volumes increase and hopefully will indeed attract more of the reprocessing infrastructure to be built in Scotland by the commercial sector once they have the proper commercial volumes. That, in turn, would get a good deal in particular for local government when it comes to income. And as I said, or as I was indicating, one of the priority materials for that new brokerage service is glass in order so we can support ambitious companies we do have in Scotland, like Dryden Aqua. It doesn't make sense that we're not having the right collection systems in place for our glass, when at the same time we have companies in Scotland who want to create more jobs and do more business if they can get their hands on that glass. So that's why we're addressing these particular uh, challenges. In the meantime, of course, there's also much to do to improve householder participation in recycling. I am very encouraged by the work that's taking place at the moment on the Zero Waste Task Force, which I co-chair with COSLA, the local government body. The task force has been considering how to reap the benefits of a, a more circular economy through the services that are provided by local governments. It has agreed to develop a charter now for more consistent recycling collections in Scotland to improve participation and recycling rates, but also to improve the quality of the recycle collected in the first place, the importance of which I indicated before. So while I can't, I can't say too much more about that at the moment, ahead of the final task force meeting in a few weeks' time, I am very hopeful that this will indeed be a very significant step forward for recycling in Scotland. We also have to remember, of course, that we have already picked the low-hanging fruit and we need to up our game on recycling. Simply more of the same will not capture the recycler that otherwise is wasted. The question is often put to me whether the effort required to improve recycling outweighs the benefits and whether securing energy from waste, for instance, might be the preferred option in some circumstances. So it's quite important I'm clear about this because where there is genuinely no better use for materials, using them to generate heat and energy is always better than simply putting those materials into landfill, big holes in the ground. But once we have truly embraced a more circular economy, there may be some materials for which there's really no further use and energy from waste will still be the, the only viable option. But I do believe we are nowhere near that point at the moment. We don't want to direct materials down the waste hierarchy to disposal. We want to move them upwards towards reuse and waste prevention in the first place. Indeed, I think we have to take, uh, make effort to find the game changers that we do now require that will create opportunities to do something better with our materials in this country. And we have to be creative and we want those ideas to come forward. Recycling targets based on tonnage are pretty blunt instruments. Heavy materials score well in recycling rates, but they may not generate the greatest carbon benefits. And Zero Waste Scotland have now done some groundbreaking work on carbon metric for materials to help shape our future efforts to capture those with the greatest carbon impact. And in parallel, Zero Waste Scotland is also assessing the scale of carbon savings that a more circular approach in our economy could achieve, and we hope to publish that work in due course. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, we need to get the principles of the circular economy out to a much wider audience. The Scottish Government is working with Young Scott, for instance, to organise a weekend event in June for young people to explore the concept of a circular economy. I'm very much looking forward to hearing what our young people say and what comes out of that discussion. If anyone's going to come up with ideas and out-of-the-box ideas and game-changers, hopefully it will be our young people. But what will engage the public to the same extent as, say, the carrier bag charge that came into force last year? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. The five pence charge was the subject of, a, of conversation up and down the country. It affected everyone in this country. And we're now seeing between 80 and 90 per cent reduction in bag use in some stores in Scotland. So the carrier bag charge is a small example of action towards a more circular economy. People are now reusing bags rather than demanding a new one. And of course, they're recognising the value of the bags in the first place and the impact on both their pockets and the environment. So what is the next big thing that will help us towards a circular economy? What will engage the people of Scotland in action? I don't know if this is the answer, but this morning, Zero Waste Scotland published a report on the feasibility of a deposit return scheme for Scotland. A deposit return scheme where you put, something, you put in something that you've used, a bottle perhaps, that then goes for recycling, and then you get some of your money back. So is deposit return perhaps the biggest next thing in Scotland? 
I think it does make sense that <clears throat> we should consider these ideas, deposit and return schemes, have worked in many countries throughout the world, Norway, Germany, Sweden, there's even some schemes in Canada, the United States and elsewhere. And I think some of the benefits we should consider seriously about deposit and return schemes is the fact that it tackles litter as well as improving recycling. Because the, the bottles and the cans we see in our streets and our communities and our wider environment, if we attach a value to those, then clearly they're more likely to be recycled so people can get money for them. And then that would clear up Scotland's communities at the same time. Jamie McGregor. Secretary for taking um, an intervention on this. I'm wearing his fisheries hat. Is the, uh, the, 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 the oncoming question of discards uh, coming in from the fishing industry going to add uh, uh, an extra um, element to the, to the recycling issue? Cabinet Secretary. Well, our fishing industry is involved in a number of initiatives, particularly fishing for litter, which is not so much discards, uh, but discards, of course, and the discard bans and the landing obligations that are, that are already begun to come into force in Scotland uh, do pose challenges in terms of dealing with the, the fish that's landed ashore. It has to be dealt with. It can't be sold commercially. Uh, but, of course, I'm confident we will find sustainable good uses for that. So that is certainly a waste issue, and uh, uh, there's wider waste issues in, in many of our industries that we have to address. So the circular economy is about an approach, a concept, and it's having an overarching approach to everything that's happening within Scotland's economy at the same time. So deposit return schemes, however, may be one big idea we want to take forward. We'll consider the outcome of the report that's been published this morning, and we'll consult with business and the public, environmental organisations and others uh, as we decide how to take that forward. It may even be worthwhile, of course, uh, as I plan to do, speaking to the rest of the UK. Perhaps we should take a lead in Scotland and try and persuade the rest of the UK that if we do indeed decide to take this forward, we should do so in conjunction, if we can persuade them to do so, with the rest of the UK, which will, of course, help address some of the big issues and some of the costs at the same time. So I'll certainly open up these conversations uh, with UK ministers elsewhere. But the other ideas have been brought forward by people. Uh, the spring 2015 edition of Zero Waste Scotland's excellent newsletter Towards Zero has a whole lot of ideas within it. Lang Banks from WWF moots whether we can do more with concepts such as universal adapters to help avoid the mountain of useless cables and chargers we all have at home. And there are many other ideas being brought forward as well. So in conclusion, Deputy Presenting Officer, I want to encourage everyone in this chamber and in the parliament, as well as, of course, the public and the rest of Scotland to participate in this debate, hopefully recognise its importance to the future of Scotland's economy, to the environment and, indeed, Scotland's global role. I want to encourage the debate on social media to flush out ideas. And, of course, I want to find those game changers speaking to people that can help transform Scotland's traditional economy into a circular economy and I very much look forward to constructive and hopefully creative contributions from members across the chamber today. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Claudia Beamish to speak to and to move amendment 13134.2, please, 10 minutes or so. Thank you, presiding officer, and I move our amendment in my name. And I'm pleased that Scottish Government has called this debate and that we will thus be able to focus on how to take forward the circular economy identifying opportunities and how to break down barriers to progress. A debate such as this is an opportunity for members and others with an interest to learn from each other by listening as well. And this should lead to a further, further clear action by the Scottish Government, local authorities, businesses and consumers. Scottish Labour is supportive of working towards a circular economy. We have been determined to address the challenges posed by waste and resource use for many years. We brought in the first recycling targets in 2003, when Scotland relied on landfill for 91% of its municipal waste, with deplorable levels of recycling at 4%. So in that context, I particularly look forward to the findings of the task force later on about the issue of recycling, which the Cabinet Secretary raised today. Working towards a circular economy is key to dealing with a number of imperatives which must be addressed, here and globally. Concerns about climate change and the contribution of methane from landfill, the increasing scarcity of resources and the need to preserve them and share them justly on a global and national basis, and energy gaining, which we are recovering from waste food, as the Cabinet Secretary mentioned, and in other ways. We will be supporting the Scottish Government motion today, and I look forward to the Circular Economy Roadmap in the autumn and hope that people from across this chamber and across Scotland and beyond can contribute to that. Focusing on our amendment, 
Before contributing to the exploration of the way forward, I want to highlight concerns about workers in the present waste and resource use industry as expressed in Unison Scotland's survey of waste management staff entitled Dumped On. Unison highlight the regulatory framework governing waste management in Scotland. Its paper notes, I quote, the amount of waste which will be required to be reused or recycling will continue to rise, particularly in relation to moving towards a circular economy. Concern is expressed that the concept of the circular economy, on top of existing regulations, will see budgets coming under further stress in the immediate future. Unison states, I quote again, that councils are already struggling to balance their budgets as they bear the brunt of cuts overall in expenditure. Within local government budgets, there is little sign, this is in the view of Unison, despite increasing regulatory pressure, that councils seem in any way inclined to protect waste management spending. Waste management staff, they go on, are vital to any kind of civilised society, which I'm sure we all agree with. As we become more aware of the need to conserve resources, their functions are becoming more of a social and political issue. This is not being reflected in how they are funded or treated, and most definitely not in how they are paid. And that's um, the quote from them. I also want to highlight the present recycling targets. 23 councils in Scotland failed to meet the Scottish Government target recycling 50% of household waste uh, by 2013. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain ways in his closing remarks in, in which the Scottish Government is supporting the requirements placed on local authorities now for waste management and as we move towards a circular economy, both to better support workers in the industry and to achieve targets which necessitate a shift in operational practices? In the Rural Affairs Committee, starting in October of 2013, we have given attention to understanding the circular economy, which I admit I had no idea about until that time, and leading to a letter and a response from the Cabinet Secretary last year. We heard from Pro Professor Stahl of the Product Life Institute about a new economic mo mo model. He gave the example of Rolls-Royce, which, I quote, changed from a model of selling engines and spare parts to selling power by the hour. Under the new model, you could make profits by prevention. Basically, you could keep engines running so that you ensure that you have the lowest possible repair and maintenance costs. Once you have done it, you are much better off. But the changeover is difficult. This is where government advice and support is essential. And Scotland's zero waste, safeguarding Scotland's resources, blueprint for a more resource efficient and circular economy will be helpful in this regard and its 20 point action plan must underpin the way forward. Then in May, our committee, um, sorry, May of last year, our committee focused on stakeholders and this further informed our understanding and thinking and to focus on one of the issues raised, we heard evidence that, I quote from our own report, uh, public procu procurement offers a good opportunity to stimulate the design of the circular products and support the uptake of different approaches to the provision of services, for example, through leasing, lending, repair and remanufacturing. Now that the Procurement Reform Act has been passed for many months, it would be helpful to hear from the Cabinet Secretary about the development of the work of the Scottish Government's procurement professionals and waste policy team, as he stated in his letter to our committee in uh, August of last year, that, I quote, we, we, they will work closely together to examine opportunities and support the application of relevant sections of the Act to future procurements. The circular economy has also been taken for by the catalytic work of organisations and groupings beyond government, such as the Aldersgate Group and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. The Foundation has made a significant contribution to the way forward and the analysis of, of that way in a series of papers. And the paper Towards a Circular Economy, Ec Economic and Business Rationale for an Accelerated Transition provides in real terms an exploration of how to achieve this change in perspective for businesses and consumers. Calling the next five years the pioneer phase, it dissects the, the circular economy success stories to find their, their common enabling factors. Under the current linear model, businesses are at risk of supply disruption, soaring resource prices and volatile levels of demand and competition. A circular economy paints a much more promising picture for both businesses and the consumer. Change in design will result in an increase in product choice and convenience and a reduction in material and warranty costs and, of course, <laughs> the environmental benefits. 
Scottish enterprise has a strong role to play in helping, the, helping Scotland to become a world leader, and the committee heard from them as well. The economic opportunities are irrefutable, as evidenced by Ellen MacArthur Foundation's Circular Economy 100 members, which include many big household names in retail, the automotive industry and design. The importance of support for product development cannot be emphasised enough. Around 80% of a product's environmental impact is decided by its very design. We must move away from technological obsolescence. Designing for regeneration will require new materials to be used, such as biological ingredients that can eventually return to the biosphere. Otherwise, products must be developed with increasing modu modularity, optimised for a cycle of disassembly and remanufacturing. This step and shift towards selling performance is an exciting opportunity for innovation. And studies show taking up this opportunity could be financially worthwhile. Waste prevention charity, WRAP, states a rapid development of the circular economy activity could create around half a million jobs and reduce under, un, unemployment in, uh, to around 1,000, uh, sorry, 120,000 120, by 2030. Furthermore, these jobs were geographically spread across the country, particularly in places where higher numbers of unemployed people are living still, where manufacturing industry sites once thrived. Our amendment emphasises also that new skills will need to be developed and innovation is already happening in Scottish further and higher education, I'm pleased to say. The University of Strathclyde's new industrial biotechnology facility is leading the way in research to innovate in industry and invigorate it in manufacturing. To ensure continuing professional development for designers, Education Scotland aim to provide design residencies. Designers will gain understanding of the challenges of waste recovery and to embed the circular theory into their work. This knowledge will assist in designing products uh, to, to be resources rather than to be throwaway goods. Education Scotland is also working with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation to ensure that the necessary skills are identified for the curriculum for excellence in our schools. Uh, and this will link with eco-schools, and I hope that there will be new projects for the circular economy even in our primary schools. Primary and secondary schools are engage engaging with renewable technologies, and STEM subjects are, of course, being encouraged by the Scottish Government and others. Professor Stahl told the Rural Affairs Committee, I quote, the problem is partly one of education and values. We come to the philosophy of how we should educate young people to define their basic needs and to focus on quality. Support for behaviour change on a society-wide scale to develop community commitment and consumer awareness is, of course, essential if we are to succeed together to develop the circular economy with all its benefits. This is one of the 20 actions in the Scottish Government's Zero Waste Plan. If we can all work together to implement them all, we will indeed become a world leader in the circular economy, and that will be to the benefit of everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Jamie McGregor to speak to and move Amendment 1314.1, seven minutes or so, please, Mr McGregor. Oh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm pleased to take part in this debate, and I thank those organisations for their useful briefings in advance of the debate, including Viridor, the Scottish Retail Consortium, Sainsbury's, and the Packaging Recycling Group of Scotland. And I think all of us can agree fully with the concept of a circular economy and the simple common sense of the idea that products and materials should be kept in high value use for as long as possible. The whole developed world must reassess how it uses our planet's resources and look again at our culture and attitudes towards waste. As Sir John Beddington, the, in 2009, the chief scientific advisor to the UK government, talked about a perfect storm coming in relation to a demand on energy and water and food security. Um, the current reality is that if everyone on the planet lived like the average European, we would need three planets to live on. Our Earth's resources can only be expected to be under greater pressure in the years ahead as the global population rises. Developing countries become more developed 
and we see a continued growth in the international middle classes who want the most modern consumer goods and an ever higher quality of life. Indeed, it's estimated there will be three billion of these new wealthier consumers by 2050. That's an incredible thought. We recognize the work being done by the Scottish Government to develop the circular economy and the good work being undertaken by many Scottish businesses, charities and individuals, including in my region of the Highlands and Islands. We also recognize the potentially significant economic benefits to Scotland of moving to a circular economy. DEFRA, for example, has estimated that the rolling out of an, of an anaerobic digestion technology to treat food waste in the UK could create 35,000 jobs. And there's also considerable scope for job creation through the EU reuse, remanufacture, and refurbishment of goods. The decommissioning of oil and gas installations in Scotland has the potential to create a substantial number of jobs as well. The Scottish retail sector is to be commended for the real progress it is making in improving resource efficiency, reducing waste, and moving towards a circular economy. We recently debated the SRC's um, excellent A Better re Retailing Climate, Driving Resource Efficiency in Scotland strategy in this chamber, and it seems clear that other sectors can learn from its good practices and its examples. Sainsbury's briefing for today talked about reducing waste in the home through their improvements in packaging. For example, introducing resealable packaging to reduce food waste and improving labelling guidance for home freezing, advising customers to freeze as soon as possible up to the use-by date instead of freeze on the day of purchase. There are also both current pressures and real challenges ahead for businesses working within the waste management sector and barriers that prevent other companies being able to take actions that are part of the circular economy. I'm delighted that Viridor, which works with 96% of Scottish local authorities, has announced £357 million of Scottish investment in the last 18 months as part of an overall investment package of £500 million in Scotland. Viridor are, however, quite correct to warn that the declines in the value of commodities on global markets presents a very big challenge sustaining progress made to date and achieving the 2020 tar sector targets. In addition, they highlight that the UK's recycling technology and systems are ageing rapidly and that a new economic realism is required if we are to make further progress. Ministers need to heed these stark warnings from Viridor and address these concerns. On the subject of the Scottish Government's recycling targets, I'm always reminded of an Inverness constituent who was also uh, a councillor at that time, who used to scream at me, no targets without markets, um, because it, he made the point that it was all very well wanting to recycle, but you had, so, had to have somewhere you could recycle things. And I, I do have some sympathy with that. Um, I think without markets, I think, I think economic realism is also necessary when these thoughts are being had. And my amendment seek, simply seeks to put down a marker that seeks to avoid any additional excessive regulation and costs falling onto the private sector. Efficient regulation is also something mentioned as being very important by Viridor, and the SRC refers to a number of regulatory barriers that can preclude innovation. We need to avoid any more regulatory barriers and costs, so I hope that all MSPs can support my amendment on this. Um, the recommendations made by the Rural Affairs Committee to the Cabinet Secretary last May are useful. The committee was right to highlight the challenges in developing a collaborative approach when we have 32 local authorities and numerous businesses and third sector organisations involved, many taking very different approaches. Support for partnership working and cooperation is important. The Cabinet Secretary talked about UK cooperation. That would be good. Uh, the committee is also correct to highlight that skills development is vital, which Claudia Beamish's amendment right, rightfully, rightfully focuses on. And to suggest embedding the concept of the circular economy within the school curriculum 
and the university sector as part of the necessary overall raising of public awareness of the circular economy is a brilliant idea. Again, the Scottish Conservatives welcome this debate and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Many, th <coughs> Excuse me, many thanks. Um, at this stage, we do have some time in hand for interventions and I can also give members speeches of up to seven minutes. Graham Day to be followed by Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Jan Potocnik, the European Commissioner for the Environment, I think set the scene for the move to a circular economy perfectly when he observed the soft laws of economics are coming against the hard laws of physics as we hit physical resource restraints. We're beginning to see tomorrow's growth will depend on making the environment part of our economic policy and making the transition now in a managed way rather than when we hit limits, tipping points and catastrophes. Against that backdrop, surely it's therefore welcome that Scotland is recognised as being at the forefront of the circular economy movement in the UK and recognised internationally as one of the early movers. As Dun Dustin Benton of the Green Alliance, which earlier this year published the Circular Economy Scotland report, put it, Scotland is a long way ahead of other parts of the UK in its policy support for resource productivity and is in a strong position to develop the technologies needed to capture high-value, innovative manufacturing opportunities in a circular economy. But in a global, never mind UK, sense, given how far we have to go and the obstacles to be overcome, then I think it would be realistic to acknowledge that we are still at the baby step stage in terms of progressing to having a truly circular economy. Although it is a quite exciting prospect lying in front of us, the Rural Affairs Committee, during its extended and extensive evidence gathering on the circular, uh, circular economy, held the opportunity for different approaches to the provision of services, for example, through leasing, lending, repair and remanufacturing, all of which were very interesting. I was particularly struck by the leasing option, not least of all because in some regards it would represent a return to a bygone era, rather like the Cabinet Secretary's mention of a possible bottle deposit return scheme. I recall as a youngster in Aberdeen in the late 1960s that my parents leased their television set. It was a quite widespread practice then. Compare and contra contrast that with nowadays, where many households have have purchased widescreen TVs littering multiple family rooms and in many cases bedrooms. Then think of the recycling centres full of discarded sets as we move on to the next craze. A major cultural change will be required to turn the clock back, as it were. And I suspect that... I'd, absolutely. Nigel Dawn. I'm grateful because this actually extends a conversation. I have Mr Dawn, we can't hear you I'm unless you face your microphone. Officer, I must turn to you with, with, with my, the member behind me. This extends a conversation I had over the lunch table because my recollection of those early TV sets was that they were leased because actually buying them would have been silly because they were so unreliable. Interestingly, we've now got to the point where we want to jack them, send them back because we want the latest version. Actually, I think the model has changed. Graham Day. Thank you for that. Um, as I said, it's a major cultural change that will be required to turn the clock back, as it were. Uh, and there will be resistance, no doubt about that. But we absolutely need to pursue this. In terms of repair and remanufacturing, there are certainly merits, but again, challenges. We will need to get supermarkets and high street electrical retailers to buy into this concept in order to reverse an ingrained attitude. They would have to be prepared to provide good quality products that last longer and are easy to repair rather than the bargain deals they currently offer on certain appliances. If they don't, then what motivation is there for the public to change behaviour if they can replace items ranging from large kitchen goods down to microwaves, kettles, etc. for relatively little? I highlight these points not as a discouragement of the concept, rather I'm noting what steps will be required to bring about a major but necessary cultural change. Because acceptance of the concept of technological obsolescence, or it would be cheaper just to buy a new one, provides our, uh, pervades our daily lives. Look at the scramble for the next smartphone or tablet device. How many of us actually have repair contracts on our kitchen appliances, or when the TV goes on the blink, don't just instinctively say, well, we'll just need to buy another one? Zero Waste Scotland has estimated that within the 150,000 tonnes of potentially reusable items that are currently going to landfill, 9,800 tonnes of that is made up of washing machines, and overall 51% of items at recycling centres could be reused after only a minor repair. This shows just how ingrained in our society the premise of buying sometimes only to, re to replace uh, items when they break down or when a newer model uh, comes along actually is. It was good to hear on the committee of the Hewitt-Packard factory in Scotland, which is designed to reuse and remanufacture computers uh, and hardware from Northern Europe. It was also welcome to learn 
of the £3.8 million loan fund jointly managed by Zero Waste and Scottish Enterprise to support circular economy businesses. Companies and projects such as these are one of the ways Scotland is leading the way in the UK in terms of cultural eco uh, circular economy, as I mentioned at the beginning of my speech. But there are other developments. The Scottish Government was the first national government to be a member of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation Circular Economy 100 programme. In October of last year, as we have heard, the 5p plastic bag charge was introduced, and indications are that is proving extremely successful. And as we have heard again, in January, the Cabinet Secretary opened the Scottish Institute of Reed Manufacture, which is only one, uh, one of only four in the world and the first in Europe. It is actions like these that have led to Scotland being described as a long way ahead of other parts of the UK. We already have a reuse and remanufacturing sector which employs 23,000 people, all told. The remanufacturing industry is worth £1.1 to the Scottish economy alone, and by 2020 it could grow by up to £620 million, adding another 5,700 jobs to the mix. And there are scopes to exploit the wider sectoral opportunities which, which exist. We have established industries such as oil and gas and food and drink, whose by-products and waste uh, provide great opportunities to reuse and recycle. For example, the Circular Economy Scotland report identifies a potential £150 million business opportunity in converting whisky by-products to fish feed. It also suggests that carbon emissions from melting steel from decommissioning gas and oil rigs could be reduced by 80 per cent if the steel is reused. We hear that an estimated £50 million worth of gold could potentially be wasted in Scotland through the disposal of electronic items such as computers uh, and phones over the next five years. There is another opportunity to make progress. So we are well placed here in Scotland to move to a circular economy. However, whilst governments can drive, incentivise and encourage change, we as individuals have to buy into this and deliver a societal shift. To secure buy-in, you need to raise awareness. If nothing else, presiding officer, I hope this debate does something to raise awareness of a necessary step that Scotland and the rest of the world has to take. Thank you. Thank you. And to now call Claire Baker to be followed by Dave Thompson. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, President Officer, I'm pleased to speak in this afternoon's debate and be part of the, uh, the move to promote and build a circular economy. Um, this commitment has been developed over the years of the Scottish Parliament, starting with the National Waste Strategy in 2003, with a focus on increasing the levels of municipal recycling and waste reduction. Um, we have moved increasingly from targets to the introduction of regulations to act as levers to deliver more progress. We are now seeing an increasing focus on a circular economy which presents big challenges and, as the Cabinet Secretary said, it does also present many opportunities. Um, Scotland has done well in many of the domestic targets. The behaviour of many households has changed for the positive, supported by local authorities' waste management plans. Although 23 local authorities did not manage to meet the Scottish Government target of recycling 50% of household waste by 2013, um, and we do need to consider what the reasons were for that, we have seen progress. We are seeing more and more businesses driven by demands on their energy and their production costs making positive changes to their use of resources. Um, and other members might have received an email from Sainsbury's and we also had a briefing from the Scottish Retail Consortium um, who demonstrate their commitment to a circular economy. And we have seen fantastic effort from many of our supermarkets in accepting their responsibility to address some of these challenges. Um, there are substantial economic and environmental gains to be got from the promotion of a circular economy, but it requires much more collective action from all the partners, including our HE and FE sectors, as we improve the design and make sure we have the right skills base to deliver. So I will recognise progress, but I believe we need to have a more honest debate about what the options are going forward if we are to achieve a circular economy. Um, to return to the Council targets, I had a roundtable discussion with Council leaders a while back, and I was amazed at the complexity of waste management, um, the contracts that local authorities are already tied into, uh, the waste that was high value that they could sell, combined with the waste they are having to pay others to take away. Um, the economics of waste is not something I think we fully appreciate, and I do welcome the Cabinet Secretary's comments today um, about a new brokerage service as a step in the right direction, but I also heard Jamie McGregor's comments from Viridor and the concerns they are raising around infrastructure. Um, and the responsibility for a lot of this going forward does lie with local authorities, um, and they are facing substantial strains on their funding over the next five few years, leading to the kind of tensions that are described in the dumped on report from Unison. Um, of course, a fully functioning circular economy gives greater value to waste, and some of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation report starts to recognise this and suggest ways forward. 
But if we look at the infrastructure everyone is working with, I would like to ask the government for assurances that we have this right, because I'm not sure that we do. Um, as an example, two years ago, Avondale Advanced tre Waste Treatment closed their state-of-the-art recycling facility. It was officially opened the previous year by the Cabinet Secretary. And at the time, the company director said the decision was taken in light of the weak economy, increased operating costs, the reduction in volume and market value of recyclates, and the lack of strategic facilities to handle the refuse-derived fuel. That was, from a, um, that was from a sector magazine, as you could probably tell by the technicality of the language. But the stress is that that, that was a state-of-the-art that was open for a year and it had to close because of problems with, um, with this, the... The, the economic problems as well as the availability um, to, to feed the centre, even though it was a, a state-of-the-art centre. And that, is, that situation doesn't seem to be changed because that centre has never reopened. And a few years ago, in 2002, when the committee took evidence on RPP2 on the Zero Waste Strategy, progress was reckoned, but a number of issues were raised, uh, some by James Curran, who then was the Chief Exec of SEPA, who argued there was a need to take a more national and strategic approach to the development of infrastructure to support the Zero Waste Plan. Now, there is a tension here between the desire for small-scale infrastructure and a drive towards reduction, which is favoured by many, and the sheer scale of the national waste challenge we face and the lack of a national infrastructure to manage it. And the government set the targets and the regulations, but it is local authorities, businesses and communities who are trying to deliver. And other countries have taken a much more national approach to their infrastructure needs, and I would like to know more about the government's view of this. Um, another example, the Coca-Cola bottling plant in East Kilbride is a zero waste landfill site and they have a good UK record. Um, to achieve this, they had to invest heavily in their own recycling infrastructure and equipment as neither the public or the private sector could meet their needs or standards. And currently, waste from the Scottish plant is taken to a central plant that is owned by Coca-Cola in England. So are we confident that the recycling and waste industry in Scotland is of a high enough standard to raise the value of waste? which is key to the effective circular economy. It is one of the most difficult sectors for SEPA to monitor, and the Unison report dumped on also talks about it being one of the most hazardous occupations in the UK. So the Cabinet Secretary might want to say um, a bit more about what they are doing to raise standards in the sector to support the circular economy. Um, I'd also like to say a bit about a Scottish enterprise, sorry, a social enterprise called Castle Repaint, who were based in Glenrothes and Fife. Um, Castle Repaint diverted water-based paint from landfill, turning it into a top-quality emulsion in a range of colours. Each year, over 300 million litres of paint, retail and trade, are sold in the UK. And of this, it's estimated that 50 million litres um, are unused, either stored in homes or garages or just thrown away. While there are opportunities to reuse or donate paint, there are still gallons which is going to landfill and through the waste management centres. The reprint project was then able to remove paint from this linear journey and turn it into a new product, and it's an, it was an excellent example of a circular economy. They were creative and innovative, descriptions which were valued by the Cabinet Secretary. They also provided training and skills opportunities to previously unemployed young people, benefiting the wider economy. It was then so disappointing when the enterprise had to close uh, due to the lack of viability of the project. And there were a few reasons identified for this. One was the constraints of public procurement. As a small social enterprise, they were not in a position to bid for the big public contracts. While they could have provided for a cluster of primary schools, for example, the volume required to meet public contracts excluded them. And you know, while the driver for value for money for the taxpayer is important, the bigger contract gives the best deal for local authorities, and public bodies are often collectively bidding. However, this does not recognise additional value that something like repaint could provide its contribution to the circular economy, its training and skills opportunities, its ability to support the regeneration of communities. They also talked about the difficulty, about difficulty of achieving something like, um, you know, if you had 10% of the paint needs to be recycled, built into a public contract. Um, so I feel that public procurement needs to deliver more in these areas to support these kind of um, enterprises. Also, in the case of Castle Repaint, it was difficult for them to be commercial. A commercial contract with any of the big DIY companies would have left them vulnerable. 
It was so frustrating because everyone recognised that they had an excellent project. Um, they were here in the Parliament for a week on a stall. And in so many ways, um, what they were doing was fantastic, but they just couldn't get a break. That project failed because the systems were operating against them. Um, in closing, presiding, office, presiding Officer, uh, this afternoon, I'm sure, will be a very interesting debate. We have and we continue to make progress, but in many ways, the earliest progress is the easiest. And we need to have a much broader debate about how we achieve a truly circular economy. Thank you very much. I now call Dave Thompson to be followed by Cara Hilton. Well, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. What an opportunity, uh, a chance to talk rubbish. Indeed, some may say that is my norm. I've always been a fan of the circular economy, and when I was Director of Protective Services for Highland Council, one of my responsibilities was waste management. My Head of Waste Management was Hendy Pollock, who happens to be in the public gallery today, along with uh, fellow environmental colleagues Andy Little, uh, Brian Donnett and John Herman, who have travelled from the north especially to listen to this very exciting debate. Well, actually, they were here already for a long-established lunch with me, but why let the truth spoil a good story? It was Hendy who drummed into my head the three R's, reduce, reuse and recycle. And now he and his colleagues have all been recycled into retirement, where I must admit they add great value to their local communities. The modern notion of the circular economy has deep-rooted, difficult to pinpoint origins, but it is not really new. When I was a loon in Lossy in the 50s and 60s, we wasted nothing, and I still hate waste. Food scraps went to the hens, and what the hens didn't eat went into the midden, and this in turn went into the ground as compost. Wrapping paper and string were carefully preserved and used again. Clothes were patched and handed down. Rags went to the raggy manny, who gave a balloon or toy to us loons and quines in exchange. Everything was repaired and reused, if at all possible. I made my first bike from bits I collected from the local dump. Only problem was I couldn't find any brakes, so I used the sole of my shoe against the front tyre. This taught me about friction and rapid wear, as the sole of my shoe, shoe soon had a hole in it. My mother was not too pleased, either about the shoe or the fact I'd been scavenging in the dump. It's just as well she didn't know I also collected lemonade and beer bottles from the dump, washed them in the River Lossie, and redeemed them, deposit return, at the local grocer's. The grocer must have thought that my father was a secret alcoholic, as I told the grocer I got all the bottles at home. After this golden era of the original circular economy, we arrived at the disposable economy and built in obsolescence. My first experience of this was in the 60s with a small, cheap but excellent camera. After a good bit of usage, the button for the shutter jammed. I took it apart and I found that the part of the button inside the camera had inbuilt serrations which were designed to damage the body of the camera and make it jam after a certain amount of use. Now that taught me that capitalism has only one overriding purpose, to make a profit. Therefore, if we are to get capitalists to embrace the circular economy, we must show them that it is more profitable, as legislation forcing change will never succeed on its own. The general principle of a circular economy is one that is restorative by design and which aims to keep products, components and materials at their highest utility and value at all times. There are different schools of thought, such as regenerative design, the performance economy, and the blue economy. And it all sounds good, but what does it mean in practical terms? Well, significant amounts of fossil fuels are used in fertilizers, farm machinery, processing, and through the supply chain. A more integrated uh, food and farming system would reduce the need for fossil fuel-based inputs and capture, capture more of the energy value of byproducts and manures. 
The circular economy would also increase employment, which would help fast-track use of more circular business models and assist with our use of renewable energy in the longer term. The World Economic Forum's Circular Economy Initiative has outlined three programmes to accelerate transition to a circular economy and involves over 30 global companies. Focusing on plastic packaging, uh, plastic packaging, paper and paperboard, and asset tracking, they aim to advance collaboration across major supply chains during 2015 in order to address current bottlenecks and leakages. For instance, annual material demand for polyester, which is used in plastic bottles in the textile industry, totals about 54 million tonnes, of which roughly 86% leaks out of the system. And it is estimated that nearly £2.8 billion pounds in value could be created uh, from better use of polyester alone. In addition, the total, amount, uh, and total annual production of paper and paperboard will amount to about 480 million tonnes in 2020. Some 130 million of those tonnes leak out of the system, which the mainstream programme wishes to address, and would amount to a value of around £7 billion. Asset tracking is very interesting uh, and seeks to develop a design and implementation toolkit that includes te technology choice, consumer incentives, and collaborative information sharing to address the information gaps. They prevent better decision making on what to do with a product when a first user is finished with it. Globally, consumer electronics and household appliances with a cumulative value of roughly 270 billion reach end life each year. Asset tracking could help unlock a potential value of about 37 billion annually in these sectors alone through more reuse, remanufacturing, and recycling. Jamie McGregor mentioned an Inverness councillor, uh, and I, I know who he means, uh, who um, told them that there should be no targets without markets. Uh, he, was not, he wasn't actually from Inverness, he was from the West, Kyle, I think. Uh, but his point was this. When I took over as Director of Protective Services with Highland Council, we were collecting paper separately from the main uh, waste collection to go for recycling ostensibly. But at that time, there was no market for paper. And what was happening? We were spending a huge amount of money separately collecting paper to take it down to the local dump and dump it. And myself and Hendy and his colleagues put a stop to that because it was a gross waste of money. In conclusion, presiding officer, we have much to gain, both environmentally and economically, from the circular economy. And I hope that the motion and the amendments get a unanimous support this evening. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Cara Hilton to be followed by Rob Gibson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to contribute to today's debate on the circular economy and in particular to speak in support of Scottish Labour's amendment. There's absolutely no doubt that exploiting the opportunities of the circular economy could present a tremendous boost to both our local and national economies, to job creation, to our environment and to our well-being. At a time when we face huge environmental challenges, Scotland's future has got to be a sustainable one, and the principle that resources and materials should be kept in use for as long as they can must be central to our thinking and to our practice. Maximising the value and sustainability of our finite and precious resources and ensuring that goods and products are designed with this in mind, and other members have highlighted some good examples here. Repairing, reusing, remanufacturing and recycling. We support the moves towards a circular economy because, quite simply, the current model of resource consumption is simply unsustainable. But Scottish Labour's amendment today also highlights some of the pressures being experienced by those working in waste management services, and these have been highlighted too by Claudia Beamish and Claire Baker. And as we move towards a more circular economy, I think it's important too that we think about the knock-on effect on the people on the front line working to help make this happen. 
Unison Scotland's survey dumped on working in Scotland's waste management services tells us a story of increasing work pressures as council budgets have been squeezed and the demands of the job change and grow. Many working in the sector are quite simply working harder for less, with the new initiatives that are being embraced making their jobs more demanding than ever, for, yet for less reward. And on top of this, to quote Unis the Unison report directly, Rubbish is a risky business. The Health and Safety Executive report, report that between 2004 and 2012, 97 workers and 19 members of the public lost their lives and almost 4,000 employees suffered major injuries. So working in waste management and recycling is one of the UK's most dangerous occupations. The Health and Safety Executive themselves have said that the act action is needed to address, and I quote, the terrible toll of death, injury and ill health in the waste and recycling industry. And it's a huge concern to me that at a time of rapid change in this industry, very little account appears to be, have been taken of the health and safety risk. And so I would echo Claire Baker's um, request for the Cabinet Secretary to look at this area a bit more. So while today's debate is certainly much wider than recycling and managing waste, I think we should really need to look at um, the knock-on effect of people working on the front line. Ambitious targets will be difficult to reach if they're not properly funded and if staff are demoralised, if they're not properly valued and rewarded for the, work and the vital work that they do. I hope, that, um, I hope that members will be supporting Scottish Labour's amendment today and that we can look um, further at this area further because staff working in waste management are providing an essential service to us all and I think it's time they had the recognition that they, they deserve. Members um, have referred to the numerous debate, uh, briefings we received for today's debate and I was really impressed by the work that Sainsbury's has said they're doing to drive change in this area. Um, Sainsbury's have highlighted that they don't send any waste at all to landfill as part of the 20 times 20 sustainability plan, which commits them to putting all waste to positive use. Initiatives like this from retailers are extremely welcome, not just encouraging customers to reuse and recycle, but by providing recycling facilities for a wide range of household goods, from batteries and light bulbs to books and even Easter egg packaging, but looking too at all the materials that are used in their operations right throughout the supply chain refurbishing furniture and shop floor shelving, shopping trolleys and food crates. All positive steps to address waste and resource efficiency and help progress and drive the circular economy. Presiding officer, um, I'm not going to use up all my time today, so in summing up, um, the harsh reality in Scotland and across the world is that there's ever-increasing demand for what are finite resources. So while embracing the circular economy will make Scotland more sustainable, and it does offer us significant opportunities, I think we've also got to recognise too that it's not a miracle solution either. If everyone in the world consumed natural resources at the rate we do in Scotland, then we would need almost three planets to support us and not just the one. Yet from the food that we eat to the air that we breathe, the shopping that we do, the fuel we consume, the water we drink, we rely on a healthy planet to lead our lives. So I think it's absolutely vital that as well as embracing the circular economy, the Scottish Government considers too what more can be done to encourage Scots to consume less, to consume better and to reduce their impact on the planet and ensure it's got a sustainable future. Thank you. And I now call on Rob Gibson to be followed by Angus MacDonald. Um, thank you, President Officer. I think uh, it's well recognised that Scotland's already recognised internationally as an early mover towards a more circular economy. But uh, I'd like to look at some of the uh, issues that are uh, deep in the root of this, particularly because it's about reducing the amount of energy that we use uh, and it's about making sure that we actually uh, uh, carry out the activities of recycling and the circular economy at a scale which will allow it to be efficient and that uh, clearly some of these are much more local than others. And uh, it interests me uh, in the kind of debate that we've had already with people that uh, we're concerned about uh, the local authority workers who are working in uh, uh, the areas like this and in private firms. And I just wonder whether uh, local authorities as such could take a leaf out of uh, those in countries like Norway where they have their own companies to make their own electricity from hydro in most cases with an income from that. But why can't local authorities in this country undertake commercial activity such as anaerobic digestion. You can't, you know, we have various aspects of this in uh, trial in the country, but it's usually on farm anaerobic digestion. It'd be far more easy to do that, much like it is to uh, recycle uh, the waste from gardens at a municipal level. And I believe that there could be firms to do this. If, 
it's possible under the powers of general competence for local authorities to take that approach, I think that would be a very good thing indeed. Now, at the present time, the circular economy report that uh, shows why Scotland's an early mover has given us the opportunity to assess what it is that we need to do to take this forward in a more general sense. And uh, when we've heard previous speeches about remanufacturing activity in Scotland, that's perhaps one of the most exciting and early ones. Now, I understand from uh, reports on this that the best areas for recycling and remanufacture are in energy issues, in automotive, in ICT and mobile electronics, and in medical equipment. And we can see that these are uh, products that are shared around the world, but which are possible <coughs> to recycle here, and that we have the technology, as they say, to do this. Remanufacturing in Scotland is dominated by the aerospace maintenance, repair and overhaul sector. And in addition to this sector, the top four sectors include energy, rail and automotive, as I said. These are considerable opportunities, which I don't think uh, we should uh, pass up the opportunity to deal with. Now, when I look at uh, the way in which uh, recycling uh, has, has operated um, and then on to uh, remanufacture, we realise that when people assess what we're doing, the Carbon Trust and the Knowledge Transfer Network published a report in March this year pointing to the Scottish Institute of Remanufacturing as a model of good practice for the UK, stating that the rest of the UK is lagging behind on <coughs> remanufacturing. And I think uh, when uh, the Cabinet Secretary talked about us working uh, with uh, partners beyond these shores uh, and uh, in our neighbours uh, to the south, for example, he's talking sense. In some respects, there are particular uh, elements that can be recycled properly in that fashion. It's also a fact that uh, we've got uh, the European uh, Union looking at a recycling uh, policy at this present time. And, uh, Indeed, their original policy was not backed by people because it was seen as being too unambitious. So the Commission is due to publish a new uh, approach later this year. And, you know, the scenario is that ambitious member states could and should work together to make the most of the opportunities from a more circular economy so as to give others a lead. And, you know... It doesn't mean that you have to approve of the concept of Europe, although I understand that most parties under, uh, believe that uh, the market is something which uh, in Europe they would wish to be part of. But agreeing these Europe-wide measures would deliver economies of scale and support the remanufacturing, repair and recycling markets, uh, guaranteeing a supply of suitable products for a circular economic system, increases financial returns, from collection systems and gives businesses the confidence to invest in remanufacturing and reprocessing processing infrastructure or to use second life components or materials. These were arguments uh, originally uh, produced in April earlier uh, last month in Business Green, but they're part of uh, that view in Europe that sees Scotland in a clear leading position. We already have excess uh, of uh, the European requirements in several of the areas of recycling. And, uh, you know, the landfill ban on biodegradable waste, uh, Scotland has that and the separately corrected recyclates. And by comparison, the UK government has no recycling targets apart from the EU 2020 target. And, you know, this is one of these issues that crops up again in terms of the Constitution, because uh, there are reserved and devolved issues that affect us. On traditional waste management issues, most of all the powers are devolved to Scotland. But as policy broadens into the circular economy, some reserved areas become more important. EU negotiations are, of course, reserved, and Scottish ministers can assist. But Whitehall calls the shots and doesn't, hasn't ever put uh, this Cabinet Secretary into a position of taking uh, a lead on Britain's behalf. Perhaps that's something that could change. Uh, most national taxations reserve. Scotland could not create a carrier bag tax but was able to require retailers to charge. Product standards are reserved. Scotland cannot require particular products sold in Scotland to have a set 
uh, recycled content or minimum guarantee period, but could require public bodies to set such criteria in their procurement. Product labelling is reserved. Deposit uh, return studies identifies that this is an issue that would need resolved with the UK as part of any future scheme. So we can see that there are issues there that we need to have good intergovernmental inter cooperation on. And I believe that that's the kind of practical things which new discussions about uh, the uh, settlement that's being worked out for the devolution of uh, Smith powers should be looking at as well, because they actually are ones that are quite easy to agree. And they can have a tremendously beneficial effect in terms of the development of the circular economy. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Angus MacDonald to be followed by Jane Baxter. Thank you, uh, President Officer. Um, I certainly welcome the opportunity to support the Government's motion uh, this afternoon in the hope that this debate increases awareness uh, of the circular economy throughout Scotland. Uh, we, we can see that, as a society, Scotland is becoming increasingly aware of our impact on the environment and the need to look after the finite resources we all depend on. Every day, at home and at work, we all use and dispose of these resources, and too many of those resources end up being sent to landfill. In my constituency alone, an estimated half a million pounds is spent every year by Falkirk Council on sending resources to landfill that could have been recycled. And I use the word uh, resource deliberately to highlight that Scotland needs a cultural change to achieve a circular economy. It's not waste or rubbish or excess, excess packaging that we throw away, but a valuable resource that takes time, energy and money to recreate. But I believe that more can and will be done to bring Scotland closer to a zero-waste uh, zero waste country with a circular economy. Credit must be given to the Scottish Government for the huge progress it has made towards these goals to date. The Scottish Government's focus on the economic and environmental opportunities of better resource management has, as we know, led to the creation of a national waste brokerage service. And it's also highlighted the importance of international cooperation as a circular economy requires changes to the material supply chains of national as well as multinational companies. The use of Scottish Enterprise and Zero Waste Scotland to support a wide range of companies in development of new markets for waste materials and products and the use of public procurement as a tool to increase the market for refurbished and remanufactured products all clearly indicate that the Scottish Government's approach to the circular economy is much more than just domestic recycling rates. The leadership that our government has shown in this area has led to the international community recognising Scotland as being at the forefront of the circular economy movement in the UK, as the Cabinet Secretary alluded to in his opening statement. And I'm delighted to hear that the Scottish Government will continue uh, this leadership and share their hope for the forthcoming uh, more ambitious European Commission's revised proposals for an EU a circular economy strategy later this year. Within my constituency, the amount of waste collected has decreased over the last five years, and of the waste produced, over 50% of it is now recycled or comp composted, so we have met our target. This has dramatically cut the amount of waste we've thrown away uh, into landfill, landfill sites. However, we must continue to improve on this and work towards a truly zero-waste country. I believe it's the job of the Scottish Government and all of us as MSPs, as well as our local authorities, to show leadership in this area and continually provide pragmatic solutions to improve waste management. While I welcome the support the Scottish Government's progress, while I welcome and support the Scottish Government's progress with a circular economy, I believe that at the moment there is a limited connection with the local authorities' process of collection waste and the process of remanufacturing these resources to create a circular economy, although my own local authority very much has the circular economy on its radar. Above all, we have to make the connection at a cultural level and recognise that everything we use and throw away is a resource which has a value. We must introduce into the mindset of every citizen that we must preserve, capture and use resources wherever possible, which makes both environmental and economic sense. It is hoped that these points will form part of the Scottish Government's plans to move away from, a, from the traditional linear economy of make, use and dispose to an economy that recovers and regenerates products and materials at the end of each service life. Simply put, an economy where resources are used for a short term, disposed of and new resources introduced is completely unsustainable. 
We must address this through greater resource efficiency where waste is minimised and by re reusing, repairing, remanufacturing and recycling products and materials again and again and again. We can ensure a more circular economy, which my own local authority, Falkirk Council, rightly acknowledges in its zero waste strategy for 2012 to 2022. This has long-term benefits for business as well. It is recognised that Scottish businesses can save over £1.4 billion simply by being more resource efficient, and we have to make sure that Scotland gets its fair share of the £1.3 trillion global benefit that the creating of cir circular economies can bring. The Scottish Government has set out its Zero Waste Plan, which establishes a, vig a vision for a zero waste society, and it aims to bring a step change in the way we use resources in Scotland. The Zero Waste Plan is supported by ambitious climate change legislation and I hope equally ambitious legislation to promote a circular economy and support action by businesses, householders and local authorities, not just to recycle and reduce waste, but to improve their efficient use of resources. The materials captured from recycling offer many business opportunities from recycling, reprocessing and manufacturing, but to achieve a zero waste country needs commitment and resolve from each and every one of us. Already in our communities, people are taking action to prevent waste and use resources more efficiently. Uh, these are the champions of change, and I'm convinced that we as MSPs must lead uh, the way forward, supporting those in our communities willing to take on the zero waste challenge. In closing, President Officer, I welcome and support uh, the Scottish Government's action to date. Uh, I believe that a circular economy, a zero waste economy, is a realistic and achievable goal. But more than that, it is, fundamental. it is a fundamental requirement and obligation of our generation if we are to give the next generation the same quality of life that we enjoy. It is an undeniable fact that the majority of resources we use are not renewable, and we are increasingly at risk from resource scarcity and price volatility, which ultimately affects the poorest in our society the worst. Over the last 10 years, we have seen a dramatic shift from access to cheap raw materials to restrictions on raw materials like rare earth metals, a doubling of food prices, a trebling of metal prices and a quadrupling of energy prices. With the continued expansion of the global population and the development of the BRIC countries and other newly advancing economies, we can't meet these growing resource demands in the same way we did in the 20th century by simply expanding extraction. So, President Officer, let's make sure everyone shares the Scottish Government's enthusiasm for the circular economy. Let's support those in our communities willing to take on the zero waste challenge. And let's embrace Professor Walter Stahl's cradle to cradle approach, designing goods for reuse, remanufacture, and recycle as part of a strategy to improve resource efficiency and create jobs. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, and before I call Jane Baxter to be followed by Nigel Don, just to let um, members know that there's quite a bit of time available this afternoon to allow you, as in the past, to develop your thinking and your thoughts as you go along. And we're grateful for contributions in that regard. Jane Baxter, Nigel Don. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, waste affects every one of us in Scotland. Every day, at home and at work, we acquire, use and dispose of resources. And as individuals and organisations, we are becoming increasingly aware of our impact on the environment and the need to look after the precious resources we all depend on. Most people in Scotland will be aware of the mantra, reduce, reuse, recycle. Many of us will have taken this to heart and will be thinking global and acting local by recycling as much of our domestic waste as is possible, given our local circumstances. And in a domestic setting, we can also all do our best to buy fewer heavy package, heavily packaged goods, avoid the two-for-one offers that see too much food wasted, reuse plastic carrier bags, and learn to switch off lights, walk to the local shops, and use public transport. We can recycle food waste to the compost heap and recycle old clothes and household goods to the charity shop. We might have cut back our air miles by having staycations or reduced our business miles by video conferencing. So with all this going on, you could be forgiven for thinking that the Scottish Government and the Scottish people are doing enough to protect the planet. Scotland has already made huge progress on waste. We have cut dramatically the amount of waste we throw away in landfill sites and recycling has soared. 
But when the Scottish Government published its first zero waste plan in 2010, it recognised that everything we use and throw away is a resource that has a value, a value that we should try to preserve, capture and use again wherever possible. To do that, we have to tackle all of Scotland's waste, not just the waste that local authorities collect and manage, which is in fact less than a fifth of all, of all Scotland's waste. And in any case, there are many councils which have failed to meet their landfill targets. There are all sorts of reasons for this, mainly through the challenges of raising public awareness and commitment, contamination at the point of collection, the increased cost of collection, and the cost of dealing with the methane gas produced at landfill sites. So we need to seek commitment and resolve to a zero waste Scotland from every one of us. And that commitment needs to extend beyond the domestic and public sector context, take a strategic perspective and adopt a whole system approach, that of a circular economy. A circular economy is a system whereby materials are retained in use for as long as possible, thus practically eliminating waste. Materials and energy are optimised and goods and components reused, repaired and remanufactured. This will protect the supply of key materials, su support sustainable raw material supply and boost resource efficiency and recycling. I first heard about the concept of a circular economy when, as a member of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee, we had an evidence session with the European Commissioner, Janis Potocznik, who usefully set out the broader context. He told us that the transition to resource efficiency and a circular economic model is inevitable, particularly for Europe. He also said that developing a new economy that has sustainability at its heart and is based on a more efficient use of our natural resources will create jobs, support competitiveness and cut costs, whilst preserving the health of our environment. Frankly, there is no reasonable alternative to that approach. Considering this, he recommended a change now, before our environment is even more limited. And as part of that same evidence, we heard from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that a policy on circular economy should not be a subset of environmental policy, but should sit at the heart of the development of sustainable, sustainable economies and communities. And that Scotland, with a small adaptable economy, was well placed to adopt this approach. Such a change in perspective would, in my view, radically shift the thinking on economic development at every level. So I was pleased when in January 2015, the Green Alliance published Circular Economy Scotland, commissioned by Zero Waste Scotland. The report highlighted the opportunities for creating circular economies in two sectors, oil and gas and food and drink, and it outlines a series of measures which players in each of these sectors can take forward. They illustrate a move away from the make, use, dispose to one of extracting the maximum value from resources at each stage of the process and then recover and regenerate products and materials so that a continuous loop is created. This change in attitude and approach will have implications for how we think about design, what the skill requirements of, of such an economy might be and what the implications are for Scotland's future workforce. And clearly, as the report quite rightly highlights, the finance sector and government policy relating to finance has a major role to play in enabling this change of emphasis. Attitudes to how we as a society and as consumers and producers perceive, define and quantify value and how we measure return on investments will have to change. These are, of course, concepts which the third sector and the social enterprise movement have been championing for many years, so it's reassuring to see them being brought into the mainstream. Presiding officer, in the course of preparing for this debate, I've been reading the many briefings that MSPs have been sent. I'm struck by the efforts being made across Scotland to put into practice the principles of circular economies, and it's clear that long-lasting change can only be achieved if we adopt the whole system approach and examine in detail the overall process, no matter the type of business. So there are challenges for all sectors in taking this forward. How they will develop sustainable business models, which maximise the potential of every, every resource at their disposal. And of course, that includes their workforce and their customers. In conclusion, presiding officer, I cannot do better than quote from the report of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, Scotland and the Circular Economy. The world is undergoing an unprecedented period of resource stress, driven in part by the scale and speed of demand growth from emerging economies and a decade of increasingly constrained commodity markets. Doing nothing is not an option. And I commend the work which has been done and look forward to seeing what unfolds as this moves forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I now call on Nigel Don to be followed by Linda Fabriani. A generous six minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. 
I have to say this is a fascinating debate for those of us who, like myself, have been worrying about waste for a very long time as a chemical engineer in a first existence. The proper use of materials and in particular of energy was something that was on my timetable at college, never mind in my working life. Now, we've quite rightly started with waste management because that's the very obvious place to start. And from waste management, we then get into material recycling because that's very obviously the thing to do. I was grateful to Angus MacDonald, although, for pointing out, I think, for the first time in the debate, that these really should be regarded as resources. We shouldn't actually regard anything as waste until we can think of absolutely nothing else to do with it. <coughs> So what we are really talking about is limited resource use. For example, there are some things that are not limited. We are not actually short of water. We're not actually short of sunshine, although on days like this you can't see it. But almost everything else that looks solid is actually a limited resource. And those are the things that we need to use properly. I welcome, of course, the Scottish Government's uh, Zero Waste Task Force. Uh, and I recognise that it's industry who has to be nudged in the right direction because whilst public bodies pick up the bits, it's industry that manufactures the goods which need to be zero waste, circular from design. So materials brokerage is of course absolutely fine. It's where we must be and it's where we must go. But with rising world population, rising energy costs, and reducing raw material supply, especially if we're talking about things which are already rare, then we can see that we are first approaching the point where actually we must reuse. We won't have any option. And I think Jane Baxter eloquently made the point that we don't know quite when that is, but we may as well start now. Dave Thompson, I think it was, started out by uh, pointing out his, his days as a, as a lad, and I well remember, though, in a very different part of the country, um, the things that we used to do. And, of course, food is an absolute classic case of something which is already a cyclical system, isn't it? Because everything we eat um, will, one way or another, finish up back in the grounds to grow the next lot that we'll eat. Um, and the only energy input you need, and energy input is a theme which I shall keep going at because it is the basic thing that you cannot avoid. Uh, the only energy you need for that is actually the sun. And that's why the planet is green and carries on, and will. Um, production, of course, can be enhanced if you can find another source of energy. And again, I think, I forget who was discussed it, but of course, we can manufacture fertilizer. Curiously, it's actually the nitrogen from the atmosphere and water which you turn into ammonium nitrate, which is the principal fertilizer. And all it needs, again, is some energy, which, if it was renewable, comes from the sun. So that part can be enhanced by totally renewable and natural processes. And in that context, I can't avoid the fact that phosphorus, which is the other material which farmers, as the presiding officer will very well know, uh, do need as fertilizers, is currently concentrated in the ground and has to be mined, which brings its own economic problems. But of course, once it's out there, it does actually stay in the ecosystem. I looked, presiding officer, and nobody has yet mentioned it, perhaps because of the lists, but as a chemist, I'm not worried by them at the lists of the raw materials which people have already decided we're short of. Uh, at uh, an international level, they are all metallic elements with the exception of fluorospar and graphite. Um, at the Scotland level, that was a European Union study in 2010, I think. Uh, the Scotland's 2011 study finished up with aggregates, which I think is stones to you and me, fish, palm oil, which must be substitutable, and timber, and everything else was a metallic element. Um, and I do find it strange that some of the things which we're short of in Scotland are actually abundant in the world, and there was a very strange disparity between the two lists. Perhaps that's for another day. But to reduce waste, it seems to me that we need more than regulation. We do need a change in mindset. Waste to less waste to even less waste can come by government simply regulating and nudging and doing the things we're already doing. Getting to the point where it is complete reuse and cyclical economy requires a change of attitude and one which we must therefore encourage. But I think customers could cope with that. 
I would be very, very happy if somebody could provide me with a car which I knew they were eventually going to take back and re-engineer. Because if they were going to do that, and if they had to do that, then they would make sure that the original manufactured materials were in as re uh, refined a condition as they can be so that it's the minimum effort to recycle them. And that is actually a crucial point, which I can maybe explain rather better by considering the humble plastic bag. Now, we have very recently decided that, and I should have an example in my hand, but you know fine well what I'm talking about. The ordinary plastic bag is not a terribly good thing. It's commendably light, doesn't cost a great deal, and actually, for one, doesn't really use any huge resources. But of course, we know that it's easily lost and it's easily broken, and then it becomes pretty much unrecyclable. So actually, it's bad news, and we have done what we know about. What would I like to replace that with? Well, intrinsically, we would think, give me one of those hemp ones, one of those natural raw materials, make a bag, and we've all got them, actually, I suspect, and we know that it'll last a long time, it's the right shape and size, and when eventually it falls to bits, well, it's a natural raw material, it will degrade, and it will go back into the environment. So we can convince ourselves that's not a bad thing, and we would be right. What would be even better, presiding officer, would be a plastic bag. Because as long as it's one pure plastic and we make it, and it's a resilient plastic, then we have that bag. We can use it probably for even longer. And when it finally does become unserviceable, we can recycle it. And because it's a pure material, it doesn't need to be refined. And so all you need is a little bit of heat input to turn it back into effectively the raw material from which you then manufacture the nap plastic bag. And as I said, presiding officer, there is a theme in here. You cannot avoid using energy, but you don't have to use anything else. So actually the best replacement for, for my shopping bag would actually be a single plastic, a mono plastic, which I can reuse for a long time and which I can then recycle specifically to produce the same material again. If it can be reprocessed, that's relatively easy. If it needs to be refined, that requires energy and that's the thing we need to avoid. I'm grateful to Grande for um, bringing up the subject of washing machines. I have what is probably an unhealthy interest in washing machines. As someone who worked in the detergents industry, I knew more than you would reasonably want to know about a washing machine, and I'm not going to tell you it. But can assure you that I really, really don't want to own one. I would much rather rent it, because if I did, then the person who manufactured it would want to build in reliability. It would not be in his interests for it to break down. He would use the right materials, and again, if he had to take it back at the end of the day, then he would use pure materials so that when he had to recycle it, it didn't have to be refined, it could just be taken apart, and the bits could be reused as they stand. And the only input, apart from a little bit of manpower, would be energy. I will not repeat the point. We've heard already about Rolls-Royce and aero engines. That's magnificent because Rolls-Royce now concentrate on making engines which are reliable, which is good, because we don't want planes to fall out the air anyway. But if they'll keep running even longer, that's good, because that's cheaper. And I bet Rolls-Royce have also given some serious thought to how they make them reusable, because if all those carefully machined bits, and there are lots of them, and they're very carefully machined, can be reused into the next machine eventually, or they're made from a pure material which doesn't have to be refined when it's recycled, then it becomes cheaper for Rolls-Royce. And so they will automatically do all the right things. I have managed to avoid using the word thermodynamics. That's actually what I was just talking about. If you can keep it simple, don't mix things, and you have a renewable source of energy, then actually you can do things very efficiently, very effectively, you cannot avoid using the energy. You need to avoid putting in the complexity of mixing things. And as I hope I've explained, presiding officer, if we get this right, it is a win-win because we finish up with more reliable bits of machinery and everything else. It actually costs us less, and it does actually save the planet. Thank you.
Thank you very much for that well-informed speech. Now call on Linda Fabiani to be followed by Margaret McDougall. A generous uh, six minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'll try and follow Nigel's uh, lead in that. Uh, it's been, it has been a really interesting debate, and I would think particularly for me because, hands up, I really didn't know much about this at all. Um, and uh, the first reference I heard to the circular economy was actually an interview, I think, on BBC Radio 4 on the car radio a few weeks ago with Ellen MacArthur, and uh, was amazed at just how much I got into it and how interesting I found uh, what she was talking about. But overwhelmingly, it's just common sense and seemed very, very sensible to me uh, what was being said. And um, Rob Gibson and I were smiling wryly here um, earlier at talk of days gone by and saying things go in circles right enough because we both remember quite clearly collecting lemonade bottles in Glasgow and uh, taking them back to the shops so that we had enough money to go to the cinema. Not together, I hasten to add. <laughs> Rob is that wee bit older than me. <laughs> Uh, so things do go in circles, and, and Dave uh, Thompson spoke as well about the ragman, things that some of us have memories of. A lot of that uh, was related to coming out of the war years and different things as well. But certainly um, we did move from a culture of reuse, uh, recycling, although we didn't call it that, and remanufacturing into one of uh, inbuilt obsolescence and uh, throwing things away without batting an eyelid. So, yes, it is something that we have to talk about now. And, yes, um, remanufacturing, recycling, reuse uh, does affect all of these things that we know are problematic for our world today and moving into the future. Emissions, water and energy use. And, but also that whole circular economy thing about having lower input costs if you do these things wisely. And I looked around my own constituency of East Kilbride um, because I knew there were some good examples there of these things happening. And I, I was actually quite stunned about just how much goes on in my own local area. And I would reckon that uh, everybody here, if they looked at their own constituencies and regions, would find many, many good examples of uh, larger companies doing things, small organisations doing things, which all work towards that circular hole that we, we're looking for. Uh, my own area, Langlands Moss, um, most of which actually lies in Claudia Beamish's region. Um, the walkways across the peat bog um, have all been made out of pellets uh, from rubber tyres. And actually, that's something I, I'm not convinced that the construction industry yet takes full advantage of recycling and reuse. And I'm thinking of building materials that come from old buildings that could be much better reused than this throwing up of uh, new houses and kit houses all the time using brand new materials. There are good examples, but I think we could do better. My own area has a wonderful charity called House of Hope, which as well as recycling aluminium cans, does great work uh, in recycling, remanufacturing, um, doing up furniture that, that people donate uh, so that it can be bought. It uh, looks fantastic. So lots of initiatives all been uh, very much pulled together, and I hope that the, the government's launch of the Scottish Institute of Remanufacture, of um, the Scottish Materials Brokerage Service and Resource Efficient Scotland will help in pulling all that stuff together um, and you know, looking at all elements of it so that we can achieve the targets that we all aspire to. And of course, Zero Waste Scotland have been excellent in pulling a lot of that stuff together. Again, in, in my own constituency of East Kilbride, um, Claire Baker mentioned Coca-Cola. And yes, Coca-Cola does have an excellent waste management record, though I took on board some of the comments that Claire made that we can look at um, about how you then move the stuff that is recycled. And yes, that is one of the things we have to look at in general about how everything fits together into that circular economy. Um, Coca-Cola Enterprises in East Kilbride you know, have let me know that Coca-Cola is the largest user of food-grade recycled PET, plastic and recycled aluminium in Scotland. It, um, its supply chain buys glass, plastics and metals. 
uh, from all over local areas for reprocessing and filling in the plant in East Kilbride. So, yes, of course. Alex um, I'm interested in what you're saying about Coca-Cola because I've met with them on one or two occasions and they've drawn uh, my attention to the fact that they have concerns about the possibility of a deposit and return scheme because they believe it would reduce the amount of material they need for their own recycling programme. And I just wonder if that's a discussion she's had with that company. Yes, 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 it is. And it is an interesting discussion. And that's why I think it's so crucial that we never just look at one of these elements. We have to look at the bigger picture, the overall effect of all these things and how they tie in. Circular economy is actually a very good term using it. And I'm sure that... Um, what the Cabinet Secretary has put in place in terms of advice and uh, organisations will help us have that discussion so that we do the best for everyone. But there's one thing about Coca-Cola that still fascinates me when they told me this ages ago. At the time of the London Olympics, they were so efficient in what they, they did. They were sponsors for the London Olympics that they supplied the London Olympics with Coca-Cola soft drinks and Every, all the bottles and cans that, were, that came back from that went through the process quickly enough that they were reused for the Paralympics in the same location. So that's the kind of really innovative thing uh, that can be done. Another um, big employer in, in uh, East Kilbride Sainsbury's in conjunction with DHL and up at their um, main place in East Kilbride, they also have a recycling plant in site. Uh, which is excellent. So, again, um, what really strikes me about that is the pride that the workforce have in what they're doing on that site, whether it's DHL workers or the Sainsbury workers. But what they also do, and it's something that's not been much mentioned here, is food. Um, I don't know what the word is. It's certainly not recycling. Um, but the donation of food and making sure that food waste is not just dumped. I think Dave Thompson talked earlier about what happened, used to happen with food waste, whether it was in the, the school dinner programme or other things when we were kids. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But for example, in Sainsbury's 100% of the unsold bread is turned into to animal feed. Uh, so again, that's all contributing. And they're also, I understand, the largest provider to Oxfam, outside Oxfam's own shops, uh, with clothing, accessories, books, DVDs. In looking at this debate today, I came across something that absolutely fascinated me. There's a company in East Kilbride that I didn't know about uh, called Retech. And they were actually highlighted as part of the launch of Zero Waste Scotland's Circular Economy Business Models Programme. It's based in East Kilbride, 32 employees, turnover of £3.3 .3 million, pounds, repairing and refurbishing functional used IT products. So that's certainly something I want to learn a lot more about. And I would intend, um, if uh, the company are quite happy that I do so, uh, to visit them and learn more about it. And perhaps if, if the Cabinet Secretary hasn't already been, that's the kind of initiative he would like to join me in visiting. So all in all, I think we've got a fairly good story to tell. Um, it's been mentioned a few times that I think it was the the low-hanging fruit the Cabinet Secretary mentioned that makes things a bit easier when you start off and as time goes on, things get a bit harder. seems to me there's a commitment, um, but it also seems to me that people are now getting it. Um, perhaps not the terminology, circular economy. I, mean, I was up front about not knowing what that was until a couple of weeks ago. So perhaps there's an issue there about using language that people understand uh, a bit more quickly that is immediately apparent for dumplings like me <laughs> at times. And uh, that starts in schools and it starts with young people. And again, in East Kilbride, we've got good form in that. Our three schools, Calder Glen High School, Duncan Rigg High School, St Andrews and St Brides, and I know that Sanderson High School also takes these things very, very seriously about zero waste policies and how we do that. And I would like at this point to mention Viridor and the Engineering Development Trust who every year do schools competitions, which East Co Pride schools uh, perform very, very well in. And it's about translating zero waste policy into practice and coming up with really, really good projects. Quick mention for Calder Glen High School. 
um, who won the Lanarkshire heat of the company's go for set competition this year, and I look forward to supporting them in the final very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you for that magnificent effort. I now call on Margaret McDougall to be followed by David Torrance. A very generous six minutes. Thank you, presiding officer. And I am delighted to take part in this speech today. And in my speech, I will be focusing on the North Ayrshire area and some of the work that has been carried out there, not only towards developing a circular economy, but also in meeting the zero waste and renewable energy targets outlined by the Scottish Government. I'd like to start by saying, as Claudia Beamish did, that it's disappointing that 23 Scottish councils failed to meet the recycling targets set by the Scottish Government. The target was to ensure that 50% of all household waste was recycled by 2013, with further targets of 60% by 2020 and 70% by 2025. There was also an additional target of reducing the proportion of waste going to landfill to a maximum of 5%. North Ayrshire, however, not only met, but exceeded the target by 1213 and achieved a recycling and composting rate of over 53%. In addition, they have reduced the amount of waste going to landfill by 17,000 tonnes since 2008. North Ayrshire seems like one council that is well on its way to meeting future targets and hopefully this will continue. Meeting the targets has been achieved through a number of initiatives and today I'm going to discuss two of them. Firstly, I wish to focus on the work that North Ayrshire Council is doing with Cunningham Furniture Recycling Company. The local authority encourages residents to send their unwanted, good quality household goods to the company, which then rehomes the items across Ayrshire. This new service moves waste material up the waste hierarchy and feeds into the circular economy. It's built up around North Ayrshire Council's waste strategy, which is one of the first to include a reuse target. The project helps meet targets in regards to the number of household items going to the landfill, as well as promoting reusing items. The project also provides employment and training opportunities within North Ayrshire, and over the last three years, 39 unemployed residents have been provided with either paid employment or training opportunities, with 70% leaving to positive destinations. As of March 2015, the project has won the COSLA Excellence Gold Award for Strong and Sustainable Communities and has collected 360 tonnes of furniture from more than 2,500 collections selling in excess of 5,700 items of furniture and white goods and assisting around 2,850 low-income families to furnish their homes on a budget. The charity has generated almost £190,000 of income from sales of furniture and recycled goods and carried out almost 1,000 house clearances, void claims, and estate maintenance, generating £174,000. This project seems to be going from strength to strength, and it's an excellent example of how the circular economy can work while providing opportunities for those on low incomes and those out of work. I would like to wish the team all the best for the future, and I hope other councils will start investing in some similar schemes in their own areas. The second example, the Barkip Anaerobic Digestion Plant, which, when I visited it, was the largest combined organic waste treatment and energy generating facility in Scotland. The plant not only helps us to meet renewable energy targets, but assists towards landfill diversion targets. The plant produces around 2.2 megawatts of renewable electricity from waste foods, manures and organic effluent sludge. It does so by using bacteria to break down the waste to produce methane-rich biogas, 
The gas is then combusted in gas engines to generate electricity. And it's quite amazing if you go and visit it, because you would imagine there might be a lot of waste lying around, but it's absolutely spotless. All the heat used in the process is recovered from the engines. Each year, the plant can process up to 75,000 tonnes of organic and food waste, which is turned into electricity rather than going to landfill. Furthermore, the Barkett plant was the first of its kind to incorporate a novel digestate processing stage, which produces a low-cost fertiliser that meets the PAS 110 specifications to support local agriculture. This, in my view, is another great example of how the circular economy works. So, presiding officer, to conclude, I have offered up to two very different examples, which I believe are exemplary in terms of sustaining the circular economy, and these could be replicated across Scotland. And they may seem old hat compared with some of the projects we've heard about today, but they are equally important. And perhaps they're not as sexy as the Cabinet Secretary's handbags and glad rags, but they are essential if we are to meet our targets. The Cunningham Furniture Recycling Company project is grassroots and community-based, provides jobs and helps low-income families while contributing to the local economy and reducing waste. And I'd urge other councils to look to setting up similar projects. On the other hand, the anaerobic digestion plant is an example on a much larger scale, both contributing to renewable energy targets and landfill reduction targets, while helping local agriculture. I believe we should be considering investing in this form of technology across Scotland as part of our commitments to renewables and zero waste. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Many, many thanks. Um, now call on David Torrance, after which we'll move to closing speeches. Thank you, President Officer. I want to start by agreeing with my colleagues across the Chamber today that there are many benefits of moving from a linear towards a more circular economy. We cannot simply apply 19th century solutions to the challenges our country is facing in a resource-constrained 21st century. Decoupling economic activity from the use of resources demands smart solutions. Smart solutions circulating around the efficient use of resources while fostering future economic prosperity. With new technologies come new risks. I believe that to successfully transform our economy, we need to consider all aspects of what a circular economy encompasses. We should consider what economic sectors in Scotland can benefit most from a circular economy model and aim to maximise the resultant social and environmental advantages. The Scottish Government has already taken the first steps towards facilitating a circular and performance-based economic measures. As in the renewable energy sector, Scotland has been internationally recognised for its efforts. Nonetheless, I think we should have a look at developments in other countries, in particular the Nordic countries, as they have been the forerunners in implementing policy based on circular economy principles and waste management. Today, Scotland's remanufacturing industry alone is worth $1.1 billion and employs 23,000 people. Yet, as has been set out by a Circular Economy Scotland report, Scotland's economy has the potential of profiting to a far greater extent from a circular economy approach. In place of repeating what the report says, I want to talk about one of its core messages. Cooperation between key players. First, cooperation is cru crucial to enable innovation to move from the lab and into the markets. Thus, close links between public research, as well as companies, investors and enterprise agencies, speed up this process. Second, cooperation among different economic sectors is fundamental to cross-facility and the reuse of remanufacturing or recycling of products and resources. Efficient cooperation and coordination between stakeholders can unlock the potential of a performance-oriented economy that produces high-quality products. One example of such cooperation I want to mention today focuses around reuse, reusing and putting value into byproducts from whisky distillation. Draft, 
a spent grain left over from distillation, mixed with pot ale, is already used by some distillers to produce methane, which, um, methane, which is constantly used to fuel the distilling process. Diageo's distillery at Cameron Bridge opened its bioenergy facility in 2013, which now covers 95 per cent of the site's energy demands. Additionally, the whisky byproduct can be made into protein meal for fish farming, displacing fish meal. According to a circular economy Scotland report, this idea has the potential of generating £140 million. Apart from the economic gains as such, I do want to emphasise two further aspects that highlight the advantages of a circular economy. There are social and environmental benefits. The social benefits are manifested in boosting employment levels and creating new fields within the labour market. Jobs result, res resulting out of the remanufacturing and recycling sector are deemed to be permanent as they are characterised by one and come hand in hand with a structural economic shift, generating demand for labour, thereby investing in human capital and has many positive implications for society as a whole. The environmental benefits are self-evident. Increasing resources efficiently led leads to reduction in landfill waste and its close connection to the renewable energy sector further boosts the proportion of renewables within the energy mix. Both the social and environmental advantages of circular economy has been emphasised in the recent report published by the Club Rome. The authors of the report studied the impact of implementing a circular economic approach on Sweden. The findings were astonishing. Sweden could increase material efficiency by 25 per cent overall if it organised manufacturing along the lines of material efficient circular performance based economy. All in all, the study suggests that this can result in the creation of 50,000 new jobs. If, in addition to this, Sweden focused on maximising energy efficiency by 25 per cent, as well as an increase in its share of renewables and an energy mix from today's 50 per cent to 75 per cent, a further 50,000 jobs, resulting in an economic benefit of €10 billion Euros a year, could be achieved. However, the offer also stressed, and I quote, a lot of investment will be needed to make a decoupling possibility and hence a more sustainable economic structure come true. It becomes clear that a linear economy does not simply transform itself into circular. Performance-based economy, deliberate policy measures and targeted investment are, as often, a key success. Let me talk about our Nordic neighbours again, with a special focus on reducing food losses, the collection of textiles, for reuse and recycling and improving plastic recycling rates. The Nordic Council of Ministers has set itself a key target and evaluates the progress on a regular basis. This allows for constant improvements and to learn from unavoidable mistakes. As an example, the Council soon realised that in terms of plastic collection and recycling, a one-fit-all solution is impractical, and different collection systems are now in place on different local levels. Presiding officer, Scotland too has been proactive and I welcome a government step towards a circular economy. The Scottish Government has set itself a target of reducing waste by 7% by 2017 and 15% by 2025, compared to 2011. Some improvements can already be seen. Between 2012 and 2013, the total number of households waste generated fell by 3.5%, resulting in a 20% reduction since 2007. In addition, the Scottish Government aims to recycle 70 per cent of all of Scotland's waste by 2025, which is the most ambitious target in the UK. Scotland has also joined the global network, Ian MacArthur Foundation's Circular Economy 100 programme. Not least, the introduction of a single-use carrier charge has been a milestone and raised issue among Scots on what simple measures each and every one can take to reduce waste and reuse items. Over the past few years, my constituents in Concordia and Fife has also made a considerable effort to increase in recycling levels. Statistics indicate that people are becoming more aware of recycling. In 2013, households in Fife recycled over 55% of their household waste, <coughs> which puts the region ahead in comparison with the rest of Scotland. In addition to that, up to 70% of all waste in Fife is now further recycled, reducing the amount to landfill waste. Paper was recycled into low-grade paper and cardboard products by food and garden waste was transported to an anaerobic digestion plant in Dunfermline. 
One organisation I want to mention in particular is Greener Kirkcaldy, among other projects that works with local constituents and provides them with information on recycling and re reason, reusing old materials. In a Rico shop in Kirkcaldy High Street, the organisation encourages individuals, families and businesses to take action towards a more sustainable lifestyle. It also offers a sew and repair and sewing skills and upcycle garments workshop. Just, just last week, Greener Kirkcaldy celebrated the International Compass Awareness Week. Their work is truly inspiring and welcome their commitment to foster awareness about recycling in Kirkcaldy. Notwithstanding, more measures should follow to raise awareness of the importance of recycling and reusing of materials. I also believe that we need further improvements to our infrastructure to facilitate waste management and support the remanufacturing industry. We should also follow the Nordic countries in regulation, reviewing our approach to assure the lasting impact. Lasting impact that is also determined by a level of cooperation between all relevant stakeholders, most notably the public and private sector. We cannot continue to extract resources as we did in the past. As I have said at the beginning, innovation comes with many challenges. However, I am confident that Scotland has the potential and determination to foster and further develop smart solutions and to continue to drive policies based on a circular economy mo model. Many thanks. Many, many thanks. And we now move to closing speeches, and I call on Alex Ferguson, seven minutes or thereby. Please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Like Claudia Beamish, I hadn't even um, come across the concept of, that we're debating this afternoon until the Rural Affairs Committee started looking at it in 2013. But I have to say that at first sight, the whole idea of a circular economy seems such a simple no-brainer of a principle that you wonder actually how any other type of economy could ever have emerged over the decades and centuries that have gone by. But of course, times have changed, particularly very recent times, and we no longer live in a world of apparently infinite resources, manageable demand, and very limited wealth. Because suddenly, we're faced with a world of very limited resources, almost unquenchable demand, and an ever-increasing wealth of both individuals and nations. And that is the backdrop that demands a rethink on how we look at the traditional process of making, using, and disposing, as others have defined the linear economy, and move to a circular economy model whereby we ensure that resources are kept in use for as long as is humanly possible, extracting the maximum value from them whilst they are in use, and then recovering and regenerating products and materials at the end of each service life. Like Angus MacDonald, I am indebted to the Waste Resources Action Programme, or RAP, for providing that definition of a circular economy, but it does very accurately and neatly sum up exactly what this debate is all about. At its most simple, it is out with the disposable world that we currently inhabit and in with a new world that we need to inhabit if the world's increasingly scarce resources are to satisfy its rapidly growing population. Global statistics tell it all, as other members have pointed out. By 2030, demand for water will grow by 41%, steel by 80% and energy by 33%. We will need to extract 75% more raw materials by 2040 if we keep using them at the current rate. And, and the most chilling statistic of all, as Jamie McGregor highlighted, is that if the world's entire population has the same standard of living as the average European, we would need an additional two planets to keep us going. So the more you look into this, presiding officer, the more you realise that not moving towards this model is not an option. But the hard part comes, as I think it was Claire Baker who pointed out, comes with the question, how do you move towards that economy? It's very definitely not just a question of more and better recycling, though that is an important part of the equation. As the much-quoted Professor Walter Stahl of Product Life Institute told the <coughs> Rural Affairs Committee meeting of the 2nd of October 2013, the economics of the circular economy are very important. And the economics tell you that the smaller the loop, the more profitable it is. And if you look at the economics, he continued, recycling is the least interesting option. Now, of course, this is not and should not all be about profit. But if we are genuinely talking of a new model of an economy, then profit and profitability have to be a factor. And we shouldn't shy away from that because the, the, the potential for benefit is, is enormous. Uh, the Aldergate, Aldergate group noted it is the 
componentization, that was a new word on me, the componentization, remanufacture, refurbishing and reselling of goods that is of most value to the economy and in doing so create the most high value jobs. DEFRA estimate, as somebody has already pointed out, that if all food waste in the United Kingdom was treated through anaerobic digestion technology, 35,000 jobs would be created. So whichever way you look at it, there are massive benefits to be gained from going down this route. But the change that has to come about is not just a switch that can be casually flicked on by any government or indeed any minister, because it requires a complete change of mindset and behaviour to bring it about, and that can never be achieved overnight. We're talking, after all, of a complete change of culture and attitude towards waste. And yet most companies' business models are still centred, understandably, around disposable goods and resources. Large-scale investment will almost certainly be required, and access to high-level funding is never easy, particularly at times uh, like these that we live in. And, of course, there is always a reluctance to change from tried and tested models that have stood the test of time. Although, of course, the big irony in that argument, presiding officer, is that it is time that is running out. So it is good and encouraging, as many members have noted, to have received a number of briefings from companies and organisations that have clearly got the message and are looking to drive change towards a more circular economy. And it's very commendable that the Scottish Government was the first national government to sign up to the Circular Economy 100 programme, an initiative that brings together corporations, innovators and geographic regions to use a collaborative approach to scaling up to this circular economy. And that collaborative approach has to be the right one, presiding officer. In reply to a question that I asked Professor Stahl on whether, the gov on whether government stimulus is required to encourage the required change of mindset, or whether it could come from the bottom up. He replied, I think that both are required. Big international companies, he said, probably do not need government stimulus, but small and medium-sized enterprises, as normally, lack the knowledge and the overall view. And he went on for SMEs. It would be useful if the government, possibly together with universities, could provide some kind of data bank to allow them to see what other companies have done, what the successful models are, what new capabilities and skills they might need, and where they might find those. So we are looking at a prospect of companies, universities, and government all working together on a collaborative and knowledge-sharing approach. And that is clearly the way forward if this transition to a circular economy is to proceed successfully. One surefire hurdle to prevent that transition would be any increase in red tape or bureaucracy, hence our amendment to the government motion today. But if a truly collaborative approach is taken, there is surely no reason why we in Scotland shouldn't continue to play the leading role we have already taken in bringing this transition about. We simply have to move in that direction. M member after member has given great evidence as to why that should be the case. But the simple truth is we have to do it because we don't have two other planets for us to colonise. We've got to make the most of this one, and that means maximising the use of every single possible resource available to us until that resource can literally be used no longer. We have a long way to go, as this debate has shown, but the sooner we get there, the better. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Sarah Boyack. Um, a generous eight minutes, possibly nearer 11. It's usually the other way around, presiding officer, so I'll, I'll see how we get on. Um, I think this has been an excellent debate this afternoon, um, and the fact that the benches are so sparse does not actually reflect the quality of the debate. And if I have one thought um, in terms of how we take this forward, it would be really interesting to rerun this debate with all our colleagues on the Economy and Enterprise Committee. Um, and to get all the different spokespeople in the different parties who actually lead on the economy and get them to rerun this debate and push them through the same learning process and the same engagement process. I think everybody who's spoken this afternoon has gone through, and I particularly think the points Claudia Beamish made about the work of the Rural Environment Committee, which was echoed by several members, was absolutely right. Once you get into this issue, it is an unanswerable issue, a circular economy. It makes sense in terms of sustainable development principles, how you develop a green economy. There's the half a million jobs that Claudia Beamish mentioned that we could create. Um, but weighed against that, 
there's what's happening in our economy, the financial pressures, um, the difficulty of long-term investment decisions when you've got short-term profits to make, and also the challenge of making our markets for reused goods sustainable. So there are immense challenges in creating the green economy, but it's got to be one of our objectives. Then if we look at the human side of it, as several members have talked about, the importance of consumers having the knowledge and the interest is absolutely vital. When we're recycling, knowing that we're recycling properly, knowing that the local authorities have designed schemes that people are actually using properly, there is actually quite a challenge in that. I know personally, whenever there's a minor change in how our waste is collected, even if you're really interested in the topic, you're not necessarily sure you're doing the right thing. So there's an issue about consumers and how we come into this. And then there are the massive pressures on the environment, the ex exploitation and the use of resources, scarce resources that we don't have, and also the impact of waste, the pollution of water, and even just the more, at a more basic level, fly tipping. Everybody can see the impact of fly tipping and the impact of landfill tips. So I think the speeches this afternoon have been excellent in capturing that range of challenges, that range of issues that we need to tackle. I think in terms of progress today, I think we could all agree that there's more knowledge, more expertise, and more progress in the business community, whether it's retailing or whether it's the waste management issue itself. But I think we have had some warnings. I think the Viridor, um, the Viridor uh, briefing gave it uh, quite bleak terms. It said, we face a stark choice, further success or substantial failure. And they suggest that recycling and recovery have been real UK success stories to date, but that there's not an institutionalised model. It's not across all industries. It's not being done by everybody. And that there's a potential that we actually stall or even reverse sharply backwards. So that suggestion that we need a new economic model. I go back to that first point. Those of us in the room who have become converted, we need to be joined by all of our colleagues. And it would be good to have that debate within the parties to make sure that everybody signed up to, to this agenda. Yep, Alex of Ferguson. I wonder if she would share my surprise that we haven't been joined in this debate by members of the Green Party. Did I buy it? Well, to be fair, there's only two of them. So proportionately, if we look at the representation from the rest of us, it would be less than one person. So um, let's just move on. Um, can I just say a couple of words about the Labour Amendment? Because if, what we were wanting to do was to add to the existing motion, but to throw some light on the importance of people and skills and also highlight the pressures on local authorities. Now, several members have talked about the fact that 23 local authorities have not met the targets, and I think that's something we want to reflect on. The challenges that local authorities are facing at the moment are really sharp. Um, they need help, they need support and infrastructure investment, they need some support from the Scottish Government in terms of joining up the dots, in terms of the um, issues like public procurement. Um, local authorities are looking for short-term value for money. It's really hard to take in the longer-term investment challenge that the private sector faces as well. And the issue of markets for local authorities when they're using new recycling or new procurement um, challenges, that needs to be factored. And when you look at the challenge that local authorities have, acute challenges in terms of demographic change, school, social care, it's understandable why they've not cracked this. So they need our support, and they need support from the Scottish Government. There's been a huge amount of progress in terms of making more people aware of the challenges that we face. I think the Scottish Enterprises contribution, we need to think through what more they could do. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation has clearly been leading the way. But there's a lot more that needs to be done in terms of product development. Several members have talked about that. Dave Thompson's explanation of uh, design obsolescence that is absolutely, that's actually deliberate. Um, Claudia Beamish's point about the design, the 80% of the environmental impact is all about design. And I think Claire Baker's comments about colleges and universities. So on, on one level, we know exactly what needs to be done. And I think the briefings that we've had today have been really useful. I want to reflect a little bit about the barriers issue. It's mentioned in the Conservative Amendment in terms of regulation. Now, we've got to be quite careful about this. Um, Sainsbury's, uh, sorry, the Scottish Re Retail Consortium point out, in, a, in I think a quite a critical way, that the general approach is to minimise risk, and they want to get the regulations right and proportionate. 
Now, that's true on one level, but if we go back to why there's a risk assessment here, you then go back to the section of our amendment which talks about the dumped on report, which talks about the, the risk to human health, the risk to the health of staff who work in this industry, and we need to get the regulation right. We don't have a dispute about that, but we've got to be absolutely clear that where regulations that are there to protect public health are not followed, there is a consequence in terms of people's health. So change is difficult, it's essential. We need that discussion, industry need to be involved in that process. But one person's bureaucracy is another person's transparency, monitorable form filling that leads to accountability. So we've reservations about the Conservative Amendment um, because we think it has to, we have to acknowledge the importance of proper regulation. Some of us have been briefed over the last few months about what's happening at the edge of the waste industry where we've got criminal activity. So we need proper reporting, we need proper regulation and we need proper enforcement. It's all got to be there. Now there were some comments that the Minister made which I think are actually quite important about our leadership role in Scotland but also about our leadership role within the UK. I think that's, that's actually right, but there's an economies of scale issue here that need to cut right across the UK. So while we want to be virtuous leaders, we also want to make sure that the UK economy as a whole goes with us. And I think leading by example is important. And maybe there's a bit more that we could be doing in Scotland to make some of this work. It absolutely speaks to the fact that the European regulatory framework is vital and that that needs to be right as well. But I, I take you back um, to the local authority issue and, and I actually see a continuum here from the very first Scottish Parliament right to today. We have been pushing on this agenda. Um, I'll give you the example when I was Minister. We would not have started as fast and as hard on recycling had we not had the threat of EU infraction proceedings. The first Scottish Government was threatened. If we did not get going in this, many of our waste dumps were not EU compliant and we were going to face a financial penalty. So there's a role for regulation, there's a role for financial penalties. What we need to do is to get the circular economy to work so that we get ahead of the curve, so that our businesses are the game changers, so that our businesses are the ones that benefit from other parts of the world's economy coming along behind us as well. I want to focus on the issue of third sector as well though, and I think there have been some fantastic examples given from across the country. I would want to talk about the Remade project in Edinburgh. Um, I shall be going at some point post-election to take some of my old electrical equipment, which has been accumulating um, the charges that people have talked about, old DVD stuff. I have got mountains of stuff that is now festering and gathering dust, but Remade are going to take that stuff to bits harvest the stuff that's still useful. They might mend some of it and they might pass it on to people who can't afford to buy that kit that I now regard as completely wasted. And I think the points that were made by several members were absolutely bang on there. I think there was a quote from Nigel Dawn. I thought his comment was worth um, reading back into the system. It's not waste until we really can't think of anything else to do with it. Now, Remade are leading the way because they're training people how you reuse that waste. Um, they have a, a difficult financial model like all of the voluntary sector. I also want to draw attention to the Edinburgh Furniture Initiative, the work that Foursquare is doing and the, the work that the, the Garvold organisation are doing, training people up to give them the experience. And then the examples that Margaret McDougall gave, recycling back to low-income residents who otherwise would not be able to furnish their houses, who would not be able to have white goods and would not have the things that other people have thrown away that are absolutely reusable. So we need to focus on reusing, recycling, refurbishing. When big companies are getting rid of their furniture, um, they're absolutely recyclable. And I've heard some fantastic examples of stuff that was chucked by the banking industry being recycled and being re reused by small firms and small companies. So we can make this work. The challenge is making the markets work and making the money work. For local authorities, they, are, they don't have the bodies with the expertise to do as much as they would like to do. They don't have as much money to give to the voluntary sector to make sure that all the local community projects that we're really proud of have enough money to be in the long term sustainable. So the, the comments that Dave Thompson and Claire Baker and uh, Jane Baxter made about the importance of the third sector are absolutely crucial. 
this is a debate that we need to be having across the Parliament. And if there's one thing that the Scottish Government can do in the leadership role the Scottish Government can bring people together, the local authorities, the communities, uh, the businesses, and make sure that the Scottish Government is the university passing on the research and the knowledge and the information and making sure that they work collegiately because local authorities are doing the exciting community energy stuff. Edinburgh and Glasgow will be transformative, but only if they have the support and only if they have the leadership support from the Scottish Government. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Excellent. Many, many thanks. And I now call the Cabinet Secretary, Richard Lockhead, to wind up the debate on behalf of the Government. Cabinet Secretary, you have until five o'clock. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. <clears throat> and can I very much welcome this debate. It has been very heartwarming to hear the huge support for ensuring that we elevate the whole concept of the circular economy up the Parliament's agenda. And there were many good points being made by many members across the Chamber. I think Sarah Boyack is quite right in that uh, we want to ensure those on the Economy Committee are aware of the economic potential of this uh, particular subject as well. And while there are not a huge number of members in the Chamber, there are a substantial number. And I would remind members who are here for this important debate, we are just like recycled materials. It's quality that matters, not quantity. Uh, and that was the message I gave earlier on in my debate. So that very much applies to those of us here today as well. Uh, I do feel a bit older than what I did at the beginning of the debate, because listening to Linda Fabiani, uh, and Dave Thompson, who I always thought were a huge number of years older than myself. Uh, I found myself also remembering that I used to return my uh, bottles to pay for the access to the cinema. A very brief intervention. Linda Fabiani. <coughs> OK, Cabinet Secretary, if you know what's good for you, I apologise. <laughs> uh, I didn't want you to stand for too long. That's why I was uh, hoping it was a brief intervention. But I... I it was just the, the recollection of returning our bottles to get access to the cinema, which I used to do as well when I was a, a kid, so um, I feel a bit older, uh, given that it seems quite a long time ago. And also, I also remember the horse and cart coming down the road where I lived, uh, the ironmonger collecting the scrap metal uh, as well. So, as Dave Thompson and others have said, we have had a circular economy to a degree uh, over the decades. But, of course, times have changed, and now it's a much bigger debate these days with the scarcity of resources uh, across the world. Many members have mentioned the global trends and the fact that we are facing the prospect of 3 billion new wealthier consumers on the planet by 2050, fueling demand for the planet's precious resources, just illustrate the scale of the challenge. These are resources and materials today perhaps we take for granted, but in a few decades', a few decades time will be seen as rare precious materials potentially. And that, faces, that gives us a big economic challenge as well as an environmental challenge. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving me an intervention because the, the bit that I had to miss out my speech was it's not just the use of new materials, it's also what we do with our old materials. And there are parts of Bangladesh and India that have got huge piles of our rubbish. So maybe one of our challenges is making more, of, more use of those products in this country as part of our global social responsibility. Richard Lockhead. Hey, I totally agree with that point. I think that also goes to the, the heart of this debate. But if the demand for these raw materials is going to increase, it does pose an enormous environmental challenge to the planet, but an economic challenge to every nation as well, including to Scotland. That's why we do have to show important leadership uh, on this issue, especially with the prospect of 75% more raw materials being uh, requ required in the coming 25 years. So that's why we have to look at traditionally what we've seen as waste, as precious resources, as precious raw materials. And indeed, in terms of summing up the challenge, the previous European Commissioner, Pochnik, when he visited this parliament and made a speech, he said that our old resource-intensive growth model is simply not feasible on this scale and on a limited planet. Many of the resources our economies depend on are already scarce, like energy and other raw materials, and others are limited and vulnerable, like clean water, clean air and nature. And he also said, in concrete terms, the global competition for resources will mean that we will be obliged to increase resource productivity, particularly in Europe, where we are so dependent on the import of materials. So that's why creating the circular economy is so important. It's about protecting our future, protecting our environment and economy, but protecting the future and our quality of life uh, as a people. 
So the heart of the circular economy, as the Ellen MacArthur Foundation said, is firstly minimising the amount a product has to be changed in order for it to be reused, remanufactured, refurbished. Secondly, maximising both the length of time that a product functions for and the number of times it can be reused, remanufactured, refurbished. Thirdly, optimising how materials that have been degraded beyond being able to be reused as a feedstock in one system can actually be used as a feedstock in another process or supply chain. And finally, minimising contamination and maximising the purity of material chains to increase collection and value of materials. That does sound quite technical, but it's what the recycling debate, what the reuse debate, the repair debate, the remanufacturing debate is all about and why we have to keep our materials recirculating in their own society so we're less reliant on imports from other countries because people there will want to keep their raw materials to the same quality of life we have and likewise maintain their own quality of life here in Scotland as well. And that does raise issues such as the, as the design of products, again, which many members have mentioned. Product design is a reserved issue to the UK Government, but it's very important. We work with uh, both Europe and the UK Government to address these issues. Around 80% of a product's lifetime environmental impact is decided by its design. So we have to get that right. We can't afford to not get it right. Now, again, as many members have said, the solution to a circular economy very much relies on collaboration and everyone in society working together. Local government's role, of course, has been highlighted by many members, including many of the pressures on local government, the financial pressures, the training pressures, the skills pressures, the other pressures. And, of course, we have to address them. Uh, there were some particular issues mentioned in relation to local government, firstly in terms of training and skills, etc. I should just mention that Zero Waste Scotland are working with local government employees. Uh, they facilitate the Scottish Waste Industry Training, Competency and Health and Safety Forum, and that uh, addresses many of the issues raised by Claudia Beamish uh, and others. I should also say that we're now starting modern apprenticeships with, uh, on sustainable resource management within Scotland's local councils, and five councils are now working with 31 apprentices, and that figure is expected to grow in the times ahead as well. So we want to build up the skills uh, within uh, local government. Of course, the key issue facing local government is the fact we have 32 local authorities. In the past, we've had 32 different ways of collecting the recycled, the recycled materials. We've had 32 different ways of doing things. That has created problems. It's not given the commercial confidence to the reprocessing uh, manufacturing sector to set up new plants in Scotland so we can recycle the, the glass that's collected or the other materials because they can't get the quality of the volumes they want because it's carried out 32 different ways. Briefly, yeah. Okay, Sarah Blatt. It might just be worth revisiting the whole issue of the regional networks between local authorities. I know in the early days the Minister wasn't convinced that was a good idea, but particularly now that we've got city deals coming on the agenda, a more regional approach might just make a lot more sense. Well, I, I think can everyone be a little quiet, please, Cabinet uh, Secretary? I think the way we've identified and going forward is actually the best way, which is having the 32 local authorities working together to have common procurement uh, and also to try and have a more uniform approach to how we collect materials for recycling in Scotland. The financial pressures, of course, are very real. They face the Scottish Government, they face local government, and hopefully over the next few weeks and months that will change for the better. But they are very real pressures. But the message here, of course, is it's in the financial interest of local government to address this issue because if they have better recycling systems in place, they'll get better income from the recycle that's been collected, because it'll be better quality, so the income goes up, and then the cost of carrying out the process will be shared, and therefore the costs of the process go down. So it's the financial interest of local government to improve recycling and work with the circular economy. It's also the interest of local economies as well, because if we can collect in a more uniform fashion, give confidence to the commercial sector to set up new factories for processing what's collected, that means local jobs in local communities and sustainable economic growth. So we want that to happen. So that's why it's really important the 32 local authorities work closely together. Viridor, of course, sent out a briefing to all members for this debate. And, of course, they actually said, because things are moving forward, they've announced £357 million worth of Scottish investment in the last 18 months. That includes, for instance, the UK's most advanced glass recycling facility at Newhouse in Lanarkshire, bringing 30 full-time jobs uh, and, of course, processing glass collected from 17 Scottish councils. So if we get this right, this is real jobs being created in communities across Scotland. So that's why it's really important the 32 local authorities work together on this, as they're now beginning to do with the Scottish Government. 
But it is really important, just in conclusion, that Scotland does maintain our leadership in this issue, as many members have said. I will be speaking to the, UK government, the new UK Government in the weeks and months ahead, because many of the issues are reserved in relation to uh, creating a circular economy and improving recycling and product design. EU negotiations are reserved, of course. Europe is trying to do something about this just now. The UK recently opposed the package they wanted to bring forward because they saw it as too burdensome on business. But as the Scottish Government took the view, it was right to be ambitious and it was right to promote the circular economy. So we need the UK's Government to change its position on that and support the European Union and the Environment Commissioner to take forward the agenda of creating the circular economy. Also, national taxation. If we get power over that in this country, we can look at these issues. Product standards and design and labelling are also reserved issues in this regard as well. So we need the UK Government to, to play ball. But we will continue to show leadership. I have been invited to speak at an event in London soon on this subject. We are inviting the Environment Commissioner to visit Scotland because he has got a special interest in creating the circular economy and very much sees Scotland as a leader. But we have already, of course, been showing leadership over the last few years. We have got the new Zero Waste Plan, we have got the new Safeguard in Scotland's Resources Policy. 1.46 million households in Scotland now have food waste collection services, up from 300,000 in 2010, a massive advance. We have seen a threefold increase in food waste, food waste uh, processing. We have also seen the new brokerage service set up in local government, with the 32 authorities now working closer together. As I said before, we have set up the new Scottish Institute for Remanufacture at Strathclyde University, which is innovative again and a world leader. And as I said at the beginning of this debate, we are also looking at the introduction of a deposit and return scheme in Scotland. We will consider seriously the report that was published this morning and see how best to take that forward. So, in conclusion, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I just thank everyone for their contributions. We support, obviously, our own motion and the amendments. And I want to finish off where I started by saying that creating a circular economy in Scotland is an economic, environment and moral necessity. It will create jobs in our communities, improve our quality of life and, of course, just makes good sense. So let's get behind it and make it happen for Scotland and the world. Many, many thanks. And that concludes the debate on the circular economy, waste management, and it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is decision time. And there are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. And the first question is that Amendment 13134.2, in the name of Claudia Beamish, which seeks to amend motion number 13134 in the name of Richard Lockhead on the circular economy be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you very much. Second question is that amendment 13134.1 in the name of Jamie McGregor, which seeks to amend motion number 13134 in the name of Richard Lockhead on the circular economy be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Please cast your votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 13134.1 in the name of Jamie McGregor is yes, 65, no, 6. There were 35 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And so the third question is that a motion 13134 in the name of Richard Lockhead as amended is agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you very much. And that concludes decision time. And I now close this meeting of Parliament. <laughs>